this meeting of the Littleton City Council to order on February 6, 2024. Uh, clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Barr. Here. Council Member Reichart. Here. Council Member Grove. Council Member Driscoll. Here. Council Member Ryden. Here. Council Member Peters. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, next up on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Uh, council, everyone's had a chance to review any changes to the agenda? Seeing none, it's approved without objection. Um, item four uh, is public comment. Public comments, uh, a time for uh, members of the community to come express opinions regarding issues that are not part of public hearings on tonight's agenda. A separate opportunity will be provided for comment on any public hearing. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. When you hit your three minutes, I'll let you know. Time is up. We expect comments to be civil, disrespectful, disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. City Council is not authorized by Colorado Open Meeting Laws to take action at this meeting on any issue raised in a public comment that's not a part of tonight's agenda. Uh, I may refer matters to the City Manager or Attorney for immediate comment after public comment or uh, to staff to get more feedback. I will go through the list of people we have signed up here tonight and then if you haven't signed up, give you an opportunity to come and speak. Uh, first up, we have a, a team of Todd Lambert and Angela Christensen. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, for having us this evening. My name is Todd Lambert. I'm the Superintendent of Schools for Littleton Public Schools, and I'm joined tonight with Angela Christensen, who is the President of our School Board. Welcome the opportunity just to share a few thoughts with you tonight. We came here for two reasons. One, to express a big thank you for the work that is currently being done and has been done between Littleton Public Schools and the city of Littleton, and also to talk a little bit about some of the partnership work we've been doing so far. Uh, we do want to just first off start out by the thank you. We do so many great things uh, together, whether it's managing weather, SROs, considering the safety of the city, all that work, and we just have the highest levels of trust. I, with the chief and his team and other members, and of course with Dr. Reichart now here, that's always a big plus. But that thank you just holds. Uh, with Jim Becklenberg and the city, we just appreciate his partnership and his communication. But we're really here tonight to also talk about work ahead in the future. As you know, we have been doing some work together and in initiating that work for bike and pedestrian safety. Uh, we have now scheduled meetings twice a month with Mr. Reister, with the chief, with Jim Becklenberg, also with our director, our chief of operations, Terry Davis, and we are working and collaborating together to consider the ways that we can make it more safe, not only for our students, but for the pedestrians and folks here. Uh, that work has been done in earnest and we really appreciate it. In fact, uh, in the last few weeks, uh, the first couple of meetings, it's been great to get out into our community and share some of that work together. I know you're gonna talk about some of that and you have already some of the things that the city of Littleton is doing. Please know from our perspective that we wanna be partners in that work too, whether that's uh, supporting the work you're doing at the city or also some of the changes we may make it to our own areas uh, just to make it safer for our students and for our families and for our teachers and for everybody that's there. So just again, we do want to say thank you. And I know Angela just has a few comments as well. Thanks so much. I will echo all of those comments from Dr. Lambert and um, just reiterate, we're, we are so grateful for the partnership from the city um, in all departments. And uh, we appreciate you and are looking forward to work in the future. And thank you for taking care of Dr. Reichart for us. We miss him. Thanks. And I have to admit, it feels kind of funny to talk and not have Robert reach over and shut my microphone off at the <laughs> dais. Uh, so I'll, uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Emily Dillon. Oh, Dyke. I should have put two and two together when I saw Terrible you. Terrible handwriting. Hi. <laughs> thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I am here to... Uh, because I feel urgency, uh, urgency to make our streets safer. Um, I want to tell just a couple quick little stories because um, I bike and walk everywhere all the time. Um, so a few days ago, I was approaching the crosswalk at Little Raven Elementary. There's a new lifted crosswalk with flashing lights, which is really nice. Um, 
But there were two older grandparents, I think grandparents, and then three children. They pushed the flash signal. And as they're entering the intersection, a car comes blazing by. So that's the first thing I saw. It's not surprising, but it was hard to see because the lights, it's Windermere. So there's a ton of visibility and there's a whole group of people standing there and people are not slowing down for them. Um, and then this weekend, I was walking with my husband and our baby. We have a hot pink stroller, so we are very visible. Um, and we cross Gallup to get over to the museum. And a car uh, came up behind us, and he rolled down his window, and he yelled, um, uh, that's what crosswalks were invented for. And it was so upsetting to hear that, because then I was like, well, yeah, there are crosswalks. And then I looked down the street, and I was like, but where? There isn't a crosswalk anywhere on Gallup unless you turn at Alati or um, Littleton Boulevard. So anyway, I was like, well, we're doing our best. We're trying to be safe. We are crossing in the way that we know how to at the moment. Um, anyway, we're just shaken by a couple of these experiences, and there's a lot more to be said because I spend a lot of time crossing Littleton Boulevard where there's another lighted um, pedestrian. And uh, you know what? I've given up on bells and flags. Um, I've started waving. This works pretty okay sometimes. Um, so I just, I want to say that as somebody who uses these streets all the time and who loves this city, we have got to take immediate action. And I am asking for really simple things. Like I understand we're going to talk like long-term strategy, tons of money we're going to put down hopefully to make big infrastructure changes. And that's great. But I'm asking for like painted sidewalks. Um, let's refresh paint everywhere. Uh, let's put in more stop signs. Let's lower the speed limits. Because I know on Windermere, um, when I'm biking Windermere, 30 miles per hour is very low. And I'm going to own that I am a speeder sometimes myself. Please don't hold me accountable to that. But um, so I'm just asking that we take some small, simple steps to just make things as safe as possible with what we can. And then, yes, let's build on that larger strategy. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Katie McReynolds. Hi. Um, I live at, uh, right across from Little Raven, actually down the street from Emily. And I've spoken here about safe routes to school before. And I'm here speaking on them again. I want to ask you, what makes these routes to school safe? Um, it's you guys. Is, it, is there anything more that you guys can do? Cars are prioritized in most new infrastructure in Littleton, and I'm a driver that makes mistakes. <laughs> Actually, that lifted crosswalk right by uh, the light rail, it almost lifted me off the other day. I make mistakes. I know sometimes I'm not paying attention, and um, I want a city where it's harder for drivers to make these mistakes. Um, that would be long-term infrastructure, which I know we're going to talk about today. Um, I bike with my three-year-old and my one-year-old multiple days a week, and making our roads safe is, doesn't seem like it's a mystery. Um, my daughter makes mistakes. She goes into the, side, or into the road a lot because she's just learning how to ride her bike. Um, instead of reactive measures and quick fixes, I, like Emily, would like slower traffic with designs that self-enforce drivers to slow and create protected, eventually, protected uh, separation between traffic and riders. Um, and systemically, hopefully, eliminate crash opportunities in every single upgrade from uh, here on out. Uh, we're not asking for snow clearing in the bike lanes that are not cleared anyways. Um, we just need cultural change in our city and our city staff to be the face of this change. We need political voices to have the will to stand up and say that parking is not more important than the safety of our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Josh Stewart. My name is Josh Stewart. Many of you know me as Liam's dad. Many years ago, while I was landscaping my backyard, I called a friend who was an arborist and the guy I bought firewood from to ask a landscaping question. When is the best time to plant a tree? 
I was expecting a simple answer like spring, summer, fall, something logical, but he responded, 20 years ago. Little did I know that his cynical tree guy joke that he had probably told a hundred times before and a thousand times since would have a profound impact on my life because the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today and the worst time is tomorrow. When you look at life like this, you have a new respect for regret because while we all have regrets, right there in front of us is redemption. We often don't realize that when we feel regret, we are actually f facing a choice between redemption right now or letting our regret be with us another day. The best time to talk to your mother was when she called and left a message a week ago. But the second best time is today, and the worst time is tomorrow. The best time to talk to an old friend was 15 years ago when he texted you he was getting married. But the second best time is today. The worst time is tomorrow. The best time to make our neighborhood safe for everyone was before it became fatal. But the second best time is today. The worst time is tomorrow. When you look at Littleton and all the beautiful mature trees that are a part of our landscape, I see even more significance for the best time to plant a tree. Someone 20, 40, even 80 years ago gave me the gift of those trees. I didn't know them. They had no idea who I was, but they planted that tree anyway. Planting a tree is hard work. You dig, you water, you feed until it takes hold and can live on its own. It will take a long time before it makes fruit and has ample shade. It will be a lot of work and it may never personally benefit you. It may only benefit a stranger you will never meet. Now I realize that it's our turn to plant trees. The location of the tree may not please everyone. There will be people that see no point in a new tree. After all, the trees we have are good enough. What is important is that that tree gets planted today. The best time was a long time ago. The worst time is tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Teresa Tucker. I'm going to start off this today by saying I don't mean disrespect to, any, to anyone who is a pedestrian or bicyclist who follows the rules. I live at 18 Bradbury Lane. Having experienced the death of my brother who died from a climbing accident, I know that there are accidents, actions that one can take to mitigate the risks in life. I also experienced my daughter's devastation when at two different times a friend who was longboarding died. Again, I acknowledge the actions that could have mitigated the risks. My home is on the corner of Bradbury and Aladdy. Therefore, I see three different groups of kids walking or biking to schools, to the schools, Heritage, Damon Runyon, and Euclid. Overall, the children behave in the manner they should. The cars from Heritage are a different story. But what I would like to, to address you about is the overall safety for pedestrians and bicyclists, with adults being my main focus. Over the years, as the man-powered mode of transportation has diminished and the engine-powered has increased, there are more and more incidents between the two. This is indeed an issue that needs to be examined. What I have observed recently and what I do not see addressed in your current study on safety is the actions of the man-powered. I could stand here and take up 15 minutes of your time telling stories of incident after incident of the danger that those using their feet or bicycles put themselves in. Yes, cars need to be attentive. Yes, some need to slow down. But let us not let the walkers or bikers totally <laughs> off the hook. Why, oh why, are so many people walking in the dark dressed in black or crossing the street when there is a car approaching and expecting that car to stop? Sometimes in the dark, dressed in black, and crossing the street too close to a car driving. I see pedestrians crossing the streets with their heads down in their phones bikers darting across lanes of traffic. I could go on and on. Even if you implement all these safety standards, if the biker or walker assumes that he or she is safe and or doesn't follow the rules, 
the safety protocols won't work. Stop, look, and listen. Don't walk in the dark dressed in dark clothing. There is a danger in believing that one's safety is the sole responsibility of someone else. These are lessons we were taught in first grade. It seems they are not being followed anymore. Because the pedestrian or bicyclist loses the biggest, they also should be hypervigilant. Here is a limerick I voice frequently to my 12-year-old students. This is the story of Willie McGray, who died defending his right of way. He was dead right as he went along, but he's just as dead as if he'd been wrong. I am not being flippant, but the actions of the bikers and the pedestrians have to be part of the equation. Just as drivers are taught to be Thank defensive you, Tucker. drivers, how do we promote Thank you, Ms. Tucker. defense Defensive attention, Ms. Tucker, your time is pedestrians up. Pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you. Next up, Phil McCart. Hi, my name is Phil McCart. I live in District Three. Um, so. Um, I want to talk about bicycle and pedestrian safety, but I don't want to talk about tonight's agenda on that particular subject. Um, there have been kind of comments um, since this subject has been brought up several months ago um, from certain members of staff and certain members of council about how we shouldn't expect people to slow down or they won't slow down or it's too much of an inconvenience to slow down or something along those lines and it's brought up fairly often and it's really bothered me and you know these people that have these kinds of opinions about how yeah you know people should be able to drive as fast as they want to as fast as they can the point of streets is to get cars as fast as they possibly can everywhere without regard for any other priority on the streets so i can understand that perspective because it's the default it's the norm america's been doing this for 75 years i get that but when I look around um, tonight, you know, I see a lot of people wearing red. Um, I, I just don't know how we can continue to defend this type of stance when it's clearly not motivating people. Yeah, sure, they will eventually be motivated to come out, but I can't see them winning that fight. It's, it's not gonna happen. Groups like Vibrant Littleton, we're spending a lot of time trying to build coalitions. Not everybody needs to agree with Vibrant Littleton on everything. There's a lot of different groups here tonight that are not Vibrant Littleton, but we all have one thing in common, and that is that bicycle and pedestrian safety needs to be prioritized. And this, this idea that somehow that pedestrians are the most, they need to take, I'm sorry, I'm getting really upset, that, that it's somehow their responsibility to be the most vigilant because they're at most risk is a ridiculous idea. The idea that someone who's not driving a 7,000 pound SUV is somehow dangerous or a danger to themselves just by trying to get to where they need to go. It's, it's, I'm sorry, whoever's driving the death machine, the 7,000 pound SUV, that who, who is gonna have to have the most responsibility. I, I'm sorry, I just can't respect the opinion that was spoken right before me, thank you. That's all I have signed up for the list. I am assuming there's a few more people in the audience that would like to come up. So uh, if you would just, uh, we'll, we'll work our way this way across the room here. Uh, if you just raise your hand and when you get to the microphone, um, please state your name clearly so I can shout it down here. All right, my name is Patrick Santana and I'd like to share some surprising things I encountered at a recent planning commission. Uh, when we commissioners review projects, we look at a lot of documents, often including lengthy traffic impact studies. Traffic studies cover the movement of vehicles around the site of a project. Things like how many vehicles turn at intersection, things like that. You probably know about it. Traffic studies also contain a list of roadway changes that are expected to be done, and I quote, concurrent with project. These roadway changes can be things like adding stop controls, extending lanes by hundreds of feet, even constructing new turn lanes. These changes are listed as a responsibility of the developer, meaning the cost of improving Littleton streets outside the project boundary is to be paid by the developer, not the city. So here's the rub. 
In some recent Planning Commission hearings, my fellow commissioners and I raised concerns about adverse pedestrian and bike rider conditions, safety conditions related to the projects. Some of these concerns were as simple as needing a crosswalk or a stop sign on an uncontrolled four lane, 40 mile an hour road where re new residents would need to cross. Okay, when the idea of, that these roadway changes be included in the concurrent with development as a condition, we were told that such conditions are not allowed as they are, quote, not the responsibility of the developer. To me, this process seems imbalanced. Traffic studies can enjoin a developer to fix and pay for vehicular improvements on nearby streets, sometimes even blocks away from the project. As tra and traffic studies bake this into our planning process so that commissioners do not even have to add conditions to, the, to their review. Vehicular improvements are just there in the packet. In contrast, pedestrian and bicycle safety fixes that fall outside the project property lines are not allowed as developer conditions. And yes, we do ask city engineers if the city can make such fixes. And you, we hear things like, well, the city has that quarter considered for future improvements in the next few years. You know, these are not reassuring words. Um, personally, I'm not sure we should be telling developers they have to pay for, to adjust city streets. But if our planning process puts external roadway improvements for cars onto developers, as it currently does, then it should, shouldn't it equally do so for people on foot, bike, or wheelchair? Impact studies that only consider driver safety and convenience aren't, don't seem equitable to me. Um, big picture, if we want new developments uh, to be welcomed by existing residents and welcoming to new neighbor and to new, welcoming to new residents, our planning process should foster safer streets for everybody. So I wanted to flag this weak spot in our development review. I'd love to see council and staff bring greater balance to the mobility planning process, and it would give your planning commissioners a fuller set of tools to shape wonderful and safe places for our community. Thank you, council. Thank you. there. My name is Keely Quinn. I live in District 2. Um, I have comments on bike and pedestrian safety, but I will be saving those for later in the agenda. But I did want to pop up. There is no other time. Uh, it's oh. just a general business item. There won't be a public hearing oh, on that. Okay. So if you have then that, I, now is well, your time. Now is my time. Um, so I reviewed the slides that the staff plans to share tonight, and I wanted to thank the staff for their time preparing their presentation because um, I know that their department is understaffed. Uh, when I moved back to Littleton just under a year ago, I was very excited to hit the roads on a bike and navigate this small town without a car. But I learned quickly how unfriendly our city is to cars. In the time that I've been here, we've seen multiple deaths of pedestrians and bikers. And the problem is the roads. I am very disappointed at the amount of enforcement, education, and communication that is highlighted in the plan. The plan itself explains why enforcement doesn't work with the simple phrase, as staff allows. This human effort focused solution is nothing more than a band-aid. It won't stay on long enough and won't actually fix anything. Not only that, but it adds to the inequality in our city. In regards to education, the city isn't built for bikes, walkers, and rollers to be safe. And no amount of education can make our city safe. And the burden is not on children. What we need is protected bike lanes, traffic calming measures, and wider sidewalks. I see in the plan presented that there are call outs to protected bike lanes and wider sidewalks, and these need to be a, pr a priority, not something that happens in a year or two. Additionally, I'm disappointed to see that the traffic calming measures are being put on pause. I'm urging council to please not let all this talk be for nothing, and all of our time here to be for nothing and to encourage actual, tangible, and meaningful change to keep all citizens of our city safe, no matter how they choose to move about. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you, Matt. You were pointing at me before I raised my hand, so I didn't know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I've been... Uh, correlated with New Year's rev re, uh, resolutions, but not directly tied to it. I've been going to the gym lately, and I've been uh, running there. Um, and, I'm, and I try to pick everything in our town, you know, that's in walking or biking distance um, from me. And 
I've been going to this new gym that's right behind uh, Stinkers on Broadway and Dry Creek, and I've just been noticing, uh, you know, the, the 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 infrastructure as I run there, you know, to go exercise. Um, you know, like I come up by the seven-story building, and there's like the pedestrian bridge that goes down behind there, and then I come across the parking lot by where the dirty pit is, and I was standing on the corner waiting for the light, the crosswalk to turn green. And I was looking back at the dirty pit and I was thinking, you know, and, and the YMCA is there and I was thinking, there's no way for a pedestrian to get from this corner into the dirty pit that is right there. You know, when they zoned this and they designed it, you have to go all the way down, go down that little back road and then come back in to get to the dirty pit instead of just walking, you know, right there. And, and it just demonstrated to me such a overarching design that we arrive everywhere in our town by car, you know, and and even places like the YMCA and other places like that, all of our infrastructure is built around that one mode of transportation for how you arrive. Um, and, and I've seen this in, lot, in Centennial and lots of different places. Uh, and, you know, I really hope as we, as we, you know, in this, you know, as Josh was saying, you know, the, the time to plant is today. I hope that as we go through this year on our planning and, and you know, and, and making changes that we do, that we really take to heart, you know, that there, there's parents who, you know, need to get their kids to school, but there is no safe way for those kids to get to school on their own. And so they lose independence. They lose their ability to go out and, you know, out in public and, and ride around outside in the fresh air. They have to be driven to school to get there safely. Um, I, was lo I was driving back from snowboarding a couple of days ago, coming down Broadway, and just south of Stinkers there where that gas station is, um, this, the snow was plowed up onto the cross, uh, onto the sidewalk, and there was a, an elderly woman walking in the street, you know, down Broadway. Um, and I was just flabbergasted, you know, that this is the infrastructure that we have built for our citizens. And, and I will say this specifically, especially our most vulnerable citizens. This is the infrastructure that we have built. And um, we have these, like when I, when I ride down the Lee Gulch, I think of how it just kind of intersects between all these houses. And I think it's so amazing that these people years, decades ago, set aside these trails and these parks for us to enjoy today. And I hope that we can do the same, you know, as we move forward to, to create a city that's a fantastic place for our most vulnerable, vulnerable to live moving forward in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on this side of the room that would like to speak? I'll move this way, I'm moving this way. Yep, the hat. I'm Mandy Thompson. Bear with me, I was not planning on speaking tonight, um, but in light of the things I've heard, I feel that I need to get up here and speak. Um, I live on Hill Street. I don't remember what district I'm in. My daughter, as I've spoken about before, is a classmate of Liam's at Euclid. And I'm glad to see the superintendent here tonight. I'm glad to hear that there's been some work between the city and the school district, but there needs to be more. Um, like Josh said, planting a tree the best time is 20 years ago. I don't think everybody understands what you're doing every day is affecting more people than you can imagine. The things I have to deal with in my daughter's life right now at age 12 because of what happened kill me. There are conversations I've had to have, things we've had to work through that I shouldn't have to work through with a 12-year-old. And I can tell you that not only is it affecting her and her friends and our family and our extended family, but it's also affecting the teachers because we had to have a 504 put in place for my daughter and some of that has to do with things that she has been experiencing since this accident and this tragedy. And so I, this isn't about bike lanes and it's not about sidewalks and it's not about who has the right of way. It's about making it better for everyone and so that in 20 years, the kids who are living through this now have the ability to function and to be good members of society and to help Littleton that we never have to go through this again. As a parent, as a person, as a member of the city of Littleton, I just urge everyone to never let this happen again, whatever you can do. I don't think you understand how much this is affecting everyone. Thank you. 
Anyone else? We'll go. We'll, we'll get to you, Karen, but you know, yeah. My name is Sarah. I um, moved to, my family and I moved to Littleton about seven years ago because of the schools, uh, primarily. Um, and we've been extraordinarily happy with the schools. However, I think, obviously, uh, recent tragedies and previous tragedies that have just, it's been snowballing, have made it so that us as a community, we need to kind of hold everyone accountable. I loved Josh's speech on 20 years ago or today, but things like the uh, developers and how they're planning, that's going on right now and that needs to change. There's, you know, you guys could have a huge impact on crosswalks and city streets and those can change now. One thing that the school district I feel has been outrageously frustrating to me as a parent of a kid at Euclid and a parent of a kid at Heritage is that they have made the start times for those two big giant student populations within a pretty small area of Littleton the same time. And I get that it's same time district wide. And so I'm sure other neighborhoods are having the same problem. However, that also is compounded by the fact that I'm having to drive my kid several weeks out of the year because the buses aren't working because the school district made this change and they don't have the, the transportation in place. So while I agree that as a community we need to come together um, and we all need to take responsibility for the tragedies that have happened and try and help our community heal and make things right. We also need to get every facet, including our school district, which is probably in this instance probably one of the most important factors that needs to take place. If you can change a policy so that schools times were staggered just a few years ago, there's no reason why you can't change them back quicker than what I think I've heard three years from now. So, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I won't live here, is that okay? I'll be brief. That's fine. Thank you. My name is Mark Ayub. I'm a friend of Josh. Um, I'd like for you all to consider how fortunate you are to have somebody as selfless as Josh doing what he's doing. And for all the members of the community that have come up here and spoken about this topic, and how fortunate you are, take that as a moment to decide what to do next and take action on something meaningful for the future of Littleton. And quite frankly, whether it's Littleton or Englewood or Lakewood, everybody should think that way. Think about those 20 years ago and what was done and how it's impacted everybody now. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Karen? Karen Tellinter, and I want to address another level of infrastructure of uh, whether our government is even accountable to us when we do complain about serious issues like has been talked about tonight. So we have George's Judge Totenberg saying election machines have vulnerabilities, and in her court we just had proof that not only can the election machines be hacked, it is really easy to get into them using a pen as demonstrated by J. Alex Halderman, as in the author of the definitive report about Dominion, which he started before the 2020 election. I sent you the links to this information, so perhaps you all might want to reconsider your statement about trusting a repo to have safe, secure elections. You could at least admit you might not know everything about hacking. We've had whole nations real recently realize election machines are a bad idea. Argentina, Holland, Taiwan, and now El Salvador just held transparent elections. Taiwan counted tens of millions of ballots publicly by hand and finished that same evening. El Salvador actually switched in the middle of the election by order of the Electoral Court of El Salvador because the machines were having problems. So they switched to precinct level hand count voting. This is not only possible here in Littleton, it's required that we have procedures for paper ballots and hand counting in case the power goes out. But switching the day of the election is not ideal the sooner we switch to transparent election procedures, the more transparent it will be. People don't trust their government anymore. We all know legitimate companies don't sue you for asking about the product, and only illegitimate authorities attack whistleblowers. 
In spite of the best efforts of the media, people are believing their own eyes and common sense and asking how elections can be certified where there is no chain of custody. The voter rolls are blatantly ridiculous, and we are told we aren't allowed to inspect the election machines we paid for. As the Declaration of Independence says, people are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. However, it seems Americans, like European farmers, feel we're reaching the limits of what's sufferable. We just saw in Texas that when the Supreme Court goes against the Constitution, people side with the law of the land, not lawless authorities who we have all seen fail to apply the law equally regardless of race, color, national origin, sex, religion, age, wealth, status, or ideology. As long as we have 118-year-old Heather Howell on the Arapahoe County voter rolls, we have blatant disrespect for the law. Stand with the people of Littleton against lawless elections. Mikhail Gorbachev was maybe not such a wonderful person, but he's remembered as a good guy because he knew when to stop standing with the bad guys. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And while I don't know everything about election law, I stand by my statement and do support our city clerk and county clerk uh, and have faith and trust in our elections. Uh, anybody else wish to speak? Pam. Good evening, Council. My name is Pam Chapper, and I live a block and a half from here. And I'm going to say the name of Colin Gray, who was killed on Federal Boulevard, um, just south of that double blind S curve. And that has not been addressed since then. And so I am angry that one death by car seems to evoke a huge turnout when Colin Gray's was ignored and still is. So, and in fact, what Patrick Santana referred to is a development right on that S-curve on federal, and it was not addressed in our presentations or our staff solutions. Um, so, my comment is going to be, um, you are our representatives. You are not here to implement your will, desires, ideas. Um, you're here to show us evidence, to bring evidence forward about what might be good solutions for problems that we've identified. Um, I think we all agree that safety for everybody using roads is a problem. We need to keep everyone safe. And you know, project management has a method. You don't need to invent it. It's already there. It's proven. And we know how to do it well, well in America. We just aren't doing it in this city and haven't for three city managers, unfortunately. Through a mission life cycle, you consider scope, cost, schedule, and risk with, risks with mitigations. You integrate everything in the mission for the mission life. If you're building infrastructure, you must consider the life of that infrastructure and how it impacts everyone and all users all the time. If you make an intractable problem that can't be solved in the future, because you're overreacting and what prioritizing one thing, one mission goal, instead of integrating them all now, you're doing the wrong thing. At least you should try to integrate all of the mission goals. At least try and have staff show us how many we accomplish this way. Show us five alternatives. Show us how many we get with this, 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 this. Don't jump to one conclusion. Um, that is the wrong way to build cities that are healthful. Um, so I, I could talk about this, um, as Teresa said, for 15 minutes. But uh, no, we can't prioritize safety at the cost of everything else. We've got to take the time to look at solutions that are right for Littleton. One of those is parallel paths. I, as a bicyclist, always took par parallel paths. And Littleton is lucky enough to have many of them. And in fact, Transportation Mobility Board started out with parallel paths, Powers instead of Littleton Boulevard, for example. And we can do that. It's safe, and it's great. Um, Council, you, your job for us is to act on our behalf uh, and show us Thank evidence. you, ma'am. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak? All right. Next up, item five is uh, comments and reports. We'll start with 
Council, start with Councilmember Driscoll. No report, thanks. Councilmember Ryden. Just a couple quick things, reminding everybody that um, end of January is when the point in time count um, was ha happened for the counting of our unhoused individuals. So we're gonna start to see those numbers. Um, that happens throughout the entire region. Um, so that will help inform some of our policy work, especially that we're doing with our Tri-Cities Homelessness um, sort of coordinating group. Um, I also am our liaison to the Community Services Block Grant. Um, this is the money that comes from the federal government to do needed community resources, um, feeding our seniors, housing services, assistances, and things like that. We meet quarterly. Um, and just some information for all of you. Um, there were 39 households and about 70 individuals served in Littleton that required some kind of rental or mortgage or utility assistance. And that amounted to almost $300,000 in support that was provided to those residents. Um, there were also 50 people evicted over the last four years um, in Littleton. Um, since then, the county has put in some place to get some legal aid representat representation, and for every person that had legal counsel, um, those evictions were avoided. So I think those are really important things we should consider, um, just as we think about all the added pieces of the housing crisis, um, both on the prevention side, which again is preventing homelessness through eviction support, as well as um, issues with our unhoused. That's all for now. Thank you. Councilmember Peters. Um, I think the only thing I'll mention, although it feels like we haven't been here in a while, um, is that I did join a call for Safe Streets that was national about projects that have been done for bike and ped safety. And I feel like one of the strong things that each mayor said in their presentation was to put some of these things into place and get feedback along the way, which I know is one of the sticking points with what we're discussing tonight, but I thought that was really interesting to hear from multiple states and multiple projects that have already taken place. So other cool things I got to be a part of were the police pinning um, and the Jason Crow event here, which was very eventful, and uh, the Littleton Meets grand opening, town hall, it was a fun couple weeks. Good. Good. Councilmember Reichert. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It has been a busy couple of weeks, and um, uh, I want to talk about a couple of things that I participated in. Um, I was able to participate in my second uh, Next Gen um, committee meeting, and I really appreciate um, uh, being able to be part of that group. And, and as, as I've said before, I'm really impressed with a group of people that are members of the committee. Um, I'm very thankful um, for the people who volunteered for the committee and, and are being termed out. I feel like they've done a lot of a great work and I'm, I wanna just say that I'm really appreciative to the people who've applied to be on our committees. I think it's really a valuable way to, to participate in our community. Um, and I wanna say in that particular meeting, I was really impressed with uh, the reflections of the committee members had on on kind of the, what went well and didn't go well this year. I felt like they were really um, thoughtful and honest and, and, um, and both positive, but also you know, some negative uh, opportunities to improve. And I really appreciate that work that they were doing during that meeting. I was also um, very, uh, really grateful that I got to participate in the Transport Transportation Mobility Board. It was my first meeting that I was able to participate in. And, and again, a very um, impressive group of people who've been working for multiple years to kind of improve uh, transportation and mobility in, in our community. And I really appreciate, um, I appreciate their welcome. We spent a lot of time uh, just getting to know each other, which I, I feel like was a real valuable use of time. Um, Cause I think, I hope we're gonna be working together for, for several years and I, I really appreciate that. Um, one of the t t subjects that we talked about at the meeting uh, that I think is really important for our meeting today is we, we did uh, have a conversation with staff reviewing um, the effectiveness of a couple of our um, temporary traffic calming uh, installations. And um, these were all um, kind of narrowed crosswalks that were put across various streets to, um, in an attempt to uh, make those crosswalks safer. And the, um, there were a couple uh, things that really stood out to me. One, the first thing that really stood out to me was the, the, the our, I'm so grateful for our staff's use of data and interested in collecting data and, and using data to inform decision making. 
I thought uh, it was really impressive, the data they brought to the table, and it just reinforced me, you know, as we move forward with um, projects, collecting data is an important part of that work for us to know what works and doesn't work. And the second thing um, that, um, that I'm impressed with is that it's not clear that these traffic calming um, efforts actually worked uh, with the metric that we were using there, which was slowing people down. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the lesson learned from that is that traffic calming, when you have things that are, um, uh, uh, seem on their face uh, to be something that would work, oh, of course, that'll work, let's put it in place. Um, it's not clear that they always do, and there's a value in that reflection and, and collecting data and, 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 and um, uh, reflecting on whether our efforts are working. Um, and so, you know, and then the third thing, which really may sound really lame, but traffic calming is hard. Um, you know, these, this, this effort that ha on its face um, should have worked, with, there's some evidence that it didn't, and I think it, it, it just, it, it's just hard work. And so I really appreciate that conversation that staff had with us. I thought it was really, really productive. Um, I also was able to attend the police uh, pinning ceremony with uh, Council Member Peters. I've had several meetings with um, constituents and um, colleagues on, on, the, um, on, the, um, on the council. Uh, I want to call out the connections group that welcomed me to their Friday meeting. And, you know, I think we had an honest and forthright conversation. We, I think, uh, uh, I think it's clear to me and clear to them that I don't share policy, all similar policy positions with them, but I'm very grateful for their honesty and willingness to listen to me as we uh, talk things through. And then the final thing, I was really thankful that I got to participate in the town hall uh, donor dinner. That was a lovely event, uh, really nice food, um, good, good crowd. I brought my, my mother-in-law was my plus one, um, and that was uh, a, a, a wonderful evening. And I'm, I, you know, the town hall theater um, has been an important part of our community, I think now for 40 years. And I am um, just so grateful for the work that they do, and I'm grateful that I'm able to um, go to their events. It was, it was just lovely. So thank you very much. Councilmember Grove. Yes, last month I was able to uh, make a presentation to the Littleton Citizens uh, Police Academy alumni group. And we spent an hour uh, talking about the initiatives that council is working on and had a lot of open dialogue on their concerns and answered their questions. So it was um, a great event to attend. Also learned about what they do to help our community. Next, I am a member of the Platte uh, River Working Group. And this is a group of uh, individuals that represent Inglewood, Sheridan, uh, Littleton, South Suburban, and many other organizations. Also, the county is represented there. And we're work uh, one of the things a working group is doing is to try to make the process to get a permit from the uh, Army Corps of Engineers a lot easier. It's very difficult to get those kinds of things, and we're working on that for um, our Platte River project. Also, the Arapahoe County Commissioners approved $2 million for uh, projects that the working group is going to be working on. So that's um, a nice chunk of change to help out with that. Uh, many of us attempt, uh, uh, attended the economic breakfast, where we learned um, from various business leaders, their projections of what's going to happen in our uh, cities and states here. And that was very interesting. And uh, lastly, I attended the ribbon cutting for Littleton Meats, which is on Bowles and Lowell. And if you're interested in fresh meat, uh, I encourage you to go there. It was interesting to talk to the owner. He felt very welcomed uh, by our community. And he says there's a lot different than being in Denver, he felt that very much hometown feel. So that was very gratifying to hear. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, Environmental Stewardship Committee meets uh, tomorrow night. Um, got to have a chance to sit with the chair, uh, Scott Mellon, and go over the progress that they've made to date. I'm really excited to see the draft report that is coming in April. Um, the group's thoughts and, you know, environmental stewardship is an expansive subject um, and they're really trying to tackle it head on. So uh, their report is actually now kind of homogenizing into low, medium, high uh, impact and priorities, priority areas 
areas. Um, I think they've done a fantastic job at dissecting a really complex subject matter and making it uh, readable and manageable for us as a city to start working with. So I'm, I'm encouraged and excited to see uh, that final report come April. Um, Dr. Cog has their uh, board work session coming up this month, um, and actually tomorrow, sorry. And uh, for tomorrow's board work session, there are a couple of things uh, in the Metro Vision planning uh, process. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the Denver Regional Council of Governments, but as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, they do set not only the agenda for much of our trans major transportation planning and funding that actually impacts the city's uh, transportation plans and funds as well, but um, as they start essentially venturing into the subject matter of housing, um, part of the uh, amendments in the upcoming Metro Vision plan and some of the uh, measurable indicators are included, uh, I wanted to highlight um, because it shows the impacts of both housing and transportation policy. So for example, um, we have, uh, Dr. Cog has seen and the staff has analyzed how much housing is now being put into high risk uh, fire danger areas. Um, as we see the Denver metro area, um, not necessarily densifying, but just uh, flattening and expanding uh, forever into the distance. We are seeing much of our housing stock as well as employment uh, tra traversing further and further into the foothills, into these high risk fire areas. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're not in Lafayette or Boulder, but we have this to consider um, and those residents to consider when we think about what does housing policy mean to us in the core of this uh, front range in this Denver metro area and how we are um, accepting more homes and higher density to help mitigate these risks for residents that are being pushed further and further out into these high hazard areas. Um, the second uh, subject matter that's coming out in uh, part of the goals and metrics and measurements for Dr. Cog's MetroVision planning um, is around traffic fatalities. Um, Dr. Cog's staff have recently, I, I commented on this before, but recently made a presentation regarding the dramatic increase in traffic fatalities that are occurring not only in the Dr. Cog region, but um, nationwide. And uh, they are going to be setting uh, much, obviously, uh, Region Vision Zero is part of Dr. Cog's 2020 adoption um, to essentially say, you know, no mobility, I can read the quote here, a loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. Um, I think very well sums up uh, that uh, Region Vision Zero plan. Um, Dr. Cog's gonna be putting more teeth to the metrics. Um, and actually having those metrics guide a lot of the major transportation infrastructure funding that is coming into place through the Metro Vision in the coming years. So um, I know we, we operate on a smaller scale than an MPO, but um, these things are occurring throughout these jurisdictions and in partnership with all these jurisdictions um, that we're being made aware of. So um, that is all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, a few things for me. I just have... Uh Two happy birthday wishes for people who had birthdays this week for Councilmember Ryden, and then also former Mayor Jerry Valdez has a birthday coming up as well, so I just want to wish everyone happy birthday. Those two a very happy birthday. Um, next up, uh, I don't remember when it was, two weeks ago maybe, uh, I attended the uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus Retreat, um, which was in Lone Tree. And it was a meeting of all the mayors um, in the metro area. It was a good, uh, good group. We had a good discussion on how the mayors and the cities are going to work together to advocate for kind of the metro region here. Uh, we are joined by Governor Polis and Attorney General General Weiser, um, kind of discuss big picture items here. Um, as part of that, I was also announced as the second vice chair for um, the Metro Mayor's Caucus moving forward. So uh, representing Littleton a little bit more broadly there. Also as part of that, um, the next week, we went, I went back to Lone Tree for the Lone Tree State of the City. Uh, mayor Malay uh, gave a great State of the City. It was her last uh, um, address as mayor as she served for the last eight years and she's term limited here. And so I know I was joined by the city manager, communications director, and I believe the deputy city manager was there as uh, well. Um, also in line with kind of um, representing the city uh, on a broader scale here, next week, uh, February 15th, I think that's next week, um, I will be on a panel uh, on housing in uh, across the country, but focusing on Colorado here, um, brought, uh, 
presented by the American Planning Association and Pluribus News. Pluribus News focuses on state legislatures, so their general audience is for state legislatures. Uh, they're inviting all their uh, this general assembly. Um, and so I'll be on a panel with a representative from the governor's office talking about the housing uh, crisis here in Colorado. Um, a little bit of a lighter note, uh, and kind of ties in with something later, is uh, over the weekend I had the uh, fortune to take a, a few days off and go out to D.C. with my family. They had never been visited, um, the monuments and museums there, and uh, two of the museums that I went to that I had never been to before, but I would urge anyone to go to was the um, African American History Museum and the Museum of African American Art, um, which were both uh, amazing. I spent uh, like three hours in the African American History Museum and barely made it like 30% of the way through. So it was it was impressive, um, especially with it being uh, Black History Month, which I'll get to in a little bit here with the proclamation. Um, also, I uh, see our LPS friends have departed, but uh, on Thursday, I get to be the moderator, the, the announcer. I don't know exactly what I'm doing with the LPS uh, spelling bee. So I've got some homework to do uh, over the next couple days and learn how to pronounce some words, um, hopefully, hopefully correctly. I won't make a complete fool of myself, but. There's always that opportunity. Um, and just a reminder to council that we have our council retreat coming up uh, this weekend. Should be a, uh, a good event for us to get together and talk. Uh, building off is something that uh, Councilmember Peter said uh, about the local infrastructure hub, the Safe Street and Roads for All, the SS4A uh, grants. Um, we were on that call, and is that the call you were on, or is it a different one? Okay, good. Um, uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Mike Gent was also on that as well, and I think that is a great opportunity for the City of Littleton here. There are a billion dollars of grant funds. In the last cycle, they only gave out $800 million because there were not enough applications. And as what they said, this is they were trying to teach these cities how to shoot fish in a barrel that is stocked full of fish, and the fish are still swimming after you shoot. So I, you know, get to the city manager, urge staff to really take a look at that and think big, because there's there were $200 million left on the table. We could probably could have used some of that here, I'm thinking. Um, so let's make sure we uh, make sure how to do that. And then one last thing, I kind of want to address some of the comment in uh, public comment here. Uh, this idea that uh, the desire to focus on mobility for all and bike and pedestrian safety is somehow misguided and doing the wrong thing. That's absolutely absurd to say that uh, that we are not only focusing on this the city we are still operating as a city council is handing lots of different things um, and so we're not only focusing on that we're putting a uh, renewed focus on that um, you know I think it's important because as uh, Josh said that the best time to do this stuff is 20 years ago well it wasn't done 20 years ago so we need to do it now you know if I could snap my finger and make all these changes overnight I would um, unfortunately, I'm sure council would and staff would as well. Unfortunately, that's not the way uh, it works. And much to the chagrin of me, council, everyone in the audience, uh, these changes are going to uh, take some time. It's going to take. We can't do things overnight. We can't do things in a week. Um, it's going to take a few months, a few years to get through. But what we're doing here is trying to change how we do things. You know, uh, as one of the other commenters said, I think it was Patrick Santana, that we need to not focus on just. Um, vehicular travel and make sure that's how we've been doing it for for years here and I know uh, council we've been slowly doing it and you know now sadly is uh, the time to really uh, move that forward you know we want to change how we do things we want to change the culture of Littleton always make sure it is ingrained of how we move forward in the future so we have those trees planted uh, for people uh, 20 years from now and so that's all I have so I'm gonna turn it over to the mr. mayor yes just for the sake of your marriage, uh, February 14th is next week as well, just in case. Just make sure what, what is the, what's, what, what's February 14th? <laughs> it, uh, that date does not ring a bell whatsoever. It's all, it's all, all I'm, I'm, thank, I'm thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're suggesting that I'm, I'm missing dates here and there? You said that. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you had it on your list. Uh, city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, m members of the council. I have two short reports and one longer one tonight. Uh, first one, just to underscore what one of the mayor's reports that the uh, that the city council will be holding its annual retreat this weekend for the public. Particularly, I want to just let everyone know it's at the Hilton Garden Inn in Arvada. The council will be not only having their retreat, but they'll also be experiencing a tour of downtown Arvada and kind of learning some of the lessons learned uh, from their 
some downtown uh, renovations so that we can have some more ideas for ours. So that's the reason that we're in Arvada, but the, uh, the, but the retreat is, is open to the public and uh, begins at um, about three o'clock on Friday, goes till about five, and then starts again at 8 a.m. on Saturday morning and goes till about four. So that's for all who might, might be, uh, be, be interested. Um, the uh, second item tonight, I want to highlight one of the items on your consent agreement where I'm pleased that uh, tonight we're taking action to approve a licensing agreement with Littleton Public Schools for our police department to use some of the space at the East Community Center. I know that our our our, our police chief is excited to kind of pilot and establish this space in the uh, that east neighborhood. Um, they plan to use that space for community outreach directly, host uh, neighborhood and youth meetings and, e and events there, and also have some space to write uh, write r reports and also meet with citizens who have police matters to discuss. So uh, we'll be getting into that in earnest. And I know I also mentioned that I know the East Community Center Stakeholders Group will be meeting very soon in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Assistant City Manager Kathleen Osher serves on that committee and is eager to give a, a, a report to council um, along with the school district on the progress of the East Community Center. So that's, that's exciting. Um, in recent weeks, been, we've been working with the Littleton Downtown Development Authority to resolve the issue of the LDDA's mill levy, which was not certified to the county in December as the city's was. Um, the LDDA's mill levy is an, uh, is an additional tax on property that was voted on and approved by those voters within the LDDA boundaries. The result is that the LDDA will not assess or receive the additional base level of property tax that it was expecting for this year. After review and discussion with the various legal councils involved, we have confirmed that ultimately, while the city is not the governing board for the uh, DDA, it is the governing body per the statute governing DDAs. And therefore, it is the city's responsibility uh, in partnership with, the, uh, with the, the, the DDA, but it is the city's responsibility to certify the LDDA's mill levy to the county. This statutory requirement is different from all other special districts where the district's board certifies the mill levy. So we're learning. Um, I believe it's in the interest, the best interest of the city to support the LDDA's continued maturation, planning, and services directly to the downtown businesses, such as enhanced waste collection, power washing, and snow removal. Um, on Main Street and on the, the surrounding commercial streets. The city has resources on hand in the form of the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA as we call it, funding to support the business community of Littleton from the federal government that has been earmarked for that purpose in, 20, in 2022 by the council and budgeted in 2024. Although the council could use these funds for other purposes, Covering the equivalent amount that would have been received as property tax revenue to the LDDA, that amount is $192,000, would be an appropriate use per federal guidelines. And I feel it would be a, a, a valuable investment for the city as we finalize our project downtown plans and prepare to invest millions in the future infrastructure in partnership with downtown businesses and the LDDA. So without council objection, we will proceed in, in this direction. As your city manager, I take responsibility for the need to provide this help this year. I will say we've had collaborative discussions already with the LDDA about how to ensure that this doesn't happen again and that their mill levy is certified each year. We can expect that the certification request will come forward from the LDDA along with the annual operating plan and budget which the city is also required to approve in the fall of each year. That's all I have tonight, Mayor. Council, anyone have any questions for city manager? I just had one comment about the retreat. Um, just wanted to 
put it out there that why we're um, going to Arvada, you know, we've, in the four retreats I've been a part of, we've done it in here, we've done it in event centers um, in town, we've gone out of town, um, and I found that the, uh, the, the best retreat was the one we went out of town to go visit and see what other cities are doing, get eyes on some other projects, uh, meet with other uh, councils and other staff, and then uh, probably most beneficial for us as a group is to, to get to know each other, talk to each other outside of being on the dais here, um, hanging out at dinner, um, not talking about council um, things. And so I think that's why it's, we're, we're going out of, town this, out of town this year. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's, that was the reason why. So thank you, city attorney. Uh, no report. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thanks. Next up on the agenda is item six, scheduled appearances. We have none. Item seven is proclamations. We have one proclamation tonight. Proclamation of the city of Littleton, Colorado, proclaiming February 2024 Black History Month in the city of Littleton. Whereas Black History Month grew out of the establishment of Negro History Week in 1926 by Carter G. Woodson, a noted African-American historian, scholar, educator, and publisher, he selected the second week of February as it contains the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, two key figures in the history of black Americans. And whereas the foremost purpose of Black History Month is not only to make all Americans aware of the struggle for freedom and equality opportunity, but to celebrate the many achievements and contributions of African Americans in every field from science and the arts to religion and politics. And whereas Black History Month fosters cultural awareness and understanding while encouraging education and contributions by Americans of color. And whereas since 1976, every president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month and endorsed a specific theme, which for 2024 is African Americans and the arts. And whereas Colorado boasts a rich, rich history of civic engagement and entrepreneurship by black Americans, and whereas the city of Littleton recognizes the contributions of black Americans to the continued growth and success of the state and our city, and whereas the city of Littleton celebrates the 2024 Black History Month theme of African Americans in the arts and is proud to inaugurate and recognize the first work by a black artist to be purchased for the city's public art collection, The Growing Spirit of Creative Communities, a painting by Kiana Madison. Now therefore, I, Kyle Schlachter, Mayor of the city of Littleton, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2024 as Black History Month in the city of Littleton and urge all citizens to participate in activities that foster awareness, appreciation, and celebrate African Americans' contributions to the arts in support of this year's theme. And we have um, member Ms. Uh, Madison in the audience. And Jenny, would you, do you want to come up and say a few words about the uh, beautiful new piece of art that we have in council chambers here? Thank you so much for this opportunity to be acquired into your public art collection. I know that the city of Littleton has a long history of supporting the arts in many ways for adults, for children, and I'm honored to have created this work of art during the State of the Arts event last year. And just to let all of you know, when I created this piece, it was spontaneously painted in response to the children, the adults that were there at the event and getting to engage with them. So for me, this painting captures the spirit of Littleton that I was enjoying um, as someone who lives in Denver, I know. But um, really um, happy to um, be a part of the city in this way and uh, look forward to continued collaborations in the future. Thank you. All right, next up we have the consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read by title prior to a vote of the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of a council member. A, ordinance one of 2024, an ordinance on first reading amending sections of title 10 of the Littleton City Code regarding pet limits per household and the prohibition of the retail sales of certain domestic animals. B, ordinance three of 2024, authorizing the acquisition of certain property at and near the southwest corner of Mineral Avenue and Santa Fe Drive for the construction of street, sidewalk, utility, drainage, and or related improvements as part of the City of Littleton Santa Fe Drive and Mineral Avenue Operational Improvements Project. C, ID 2458, motion to approve the 2023-2025 Council Liaisons to Boards and Commissions and Additional Outside Appointments. 
D, Resolution 6, 2024, supporting the submission of the low income tax credit application by South Metro Housing Options to the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority. E, Resolution 12, 2024, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Board of County Commissioners of the County of Arapaho, State of Colorado, regarding a financial contribution for constructing the Broadway Fiber Optic Communications for Regional Traffic Operations Project. F, Resolution 15, 2024, authorizing an amendment and restatement number two to the intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Mineral Station East Mobility Shed Improvements Project. G, Resolution 13, 2024, authorizing an amendment to an intergovernmental agreement between the City of Littleton and the Colorado Department of Transportation for reimbursement of costs associated with the Santa Fe Drive and Mineral Avenues Improvements Project. H, Resolution 19, 2024, approving an indoor space license agreement between the Littleton Police Department and the Littleton Public Schools for East Community Center. ID 2453, motion to cancel City Council study session March 12th, 2024. And J, ID 2451, motion to approve minutes of January 16th, 2024, regular meeting of Littleton City Council. Mayor, I move to approve items A through J of the consent agenda. I have a motion and a second to approve items on the consent agenda. Any discussion? See none, voting's open. <laughs> the vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. All right, next up on the agenda is, I think we are in general business, item nine, general business. Uh, we have a pedestrian and bicycle planning update and timeline alternative considerations, a presentation from uh, staff. Do you wanna take a five minute recess before we get into it? Sure. sure. I'm never gonna turn down a recess, you know that. I think, we have, I think we have half of our city staff coming to get set for yeah, this exactly. presentation too, so. Are you gonna drive, Kenan? I can drive. Okay. Well, here's the other part is, I, I can't remember whose slides are which. So, we're just gonna wing it. So once you get the one, just be like.
Uh, we're, we're back in session. Uh, I'll turn back over to the, the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Again, good evening, members of the council. Uh, on no November 28th, council set a new vision for a much heightened and ongoing sustained level of bicycle and, and, and pedestrian safety for, for Littleton. Uh, bike and ped safety, which is what we'll call it for short tonight, is uh, has been a component of our of our, our transportation planning for many years, um, but not to the level that we've certainly you know learned that we need over the past couple of the last few months, and has been articulated tonight and also by the council in several different settings. So at the at that study session that you had in November. Council gave direction to staff to to embark on a process that would you know generate and result in this higher level of uh, bike and ped safety um, through a plan, a process of planning and action. We had and following that that study session, we you know crystallized our next steps as things that we must do urgently and things that we're going to take a, take a little more time. Uh, the most urgent and the most accessible actions that we could take that, that we already have and are underway are in the areas of, of uh, enhanced enforcement and also communication and collaboration with the school district about uh, safety for all in the, the school community um, and then also the, the community more at large. You'll hear, say, you'll hear updates tonight on both of those kind of buckets of activity, the, the enforcement work that we're doing and the, uh, the, the communication work. Since that announcement of those steps, the one kind of bucket of work that we've heard the most need and interest from council about in expediting and moving faster is in the area of infrastructure and capital projects, especially those that can be piloted, I'm hearing some feedback in my own mic, those that can be piloted, demonstration projects, things that can give us some, uh, some experiment and some experience with infrastructure that will ultimately be a key part of heightened uh, bike and ped safety in our community. So having heard from a majority of council um, an interest to have a broader study session um, on those things we can do faster and what that might take, that's going to be the focus of tonight's meeting. So tonight, well, I'll just say that coming out of our, of our November study session, the next few months, these few months, were to be spent on public engagement and research on best practices beyond, in the Denver metro area and beyond, and also on um, kind of the, the work that our Transportation Mobility Board can help us with and help council with in terms of working with staff to uh, prioritize some options and solutions for council's consideration uh, this summer and as we head into the next budget season with those pilot projects originally to happen in the summer and the fall of this year. What we have tonight is an alternative approach and process that would enable us to start these pilot projects within the next couple months to actually see some of this work out in the streets so that we can, um, we can start to learn and and start to, to have that, that, that experience with those capital projects. But it's gonna take some reordering of our traditional process. As I said, usually in, in Littleton, uh, we value public engagement on the front, along with the research and data, um, and then, where appropriate, having that input and dialogue with our boards and, and commissions. What you're gonna hear tonight is a process that could enable us to accelerate these projects by six to 12 months. And to do that, however, um, we're going to have to reorder or realign those typical kind of hallmark processes that we have to do them simultaneously in parallel with the pilot projects that you'll hear about tonight. 
So the main thing, Council, we're looking for from you tonight is your direction on the path. Revisiting the path from, from November that would front load a lot of the, uh, the, the public in engagement research work and the, the TMB work. That's path A. Path B is the new one tonight, which would let us expedite this work and some of those pilot capital projects and do the public engagement and the work with our TMB in parallel or as we move into experience with some of these improvements. So staff will outline those processes. They'll also go into detail about what some of the projects are that we can actually move forward on in the next few months with the staff we had, we have now. And then we'll also outline the needs for a long-term sustained effort at bike and ped safety on our roads that will require some trade-offs and some accelerated funding and uh, some long-term reinforcement in our staffing and consulting budgets to get us to that level where we believe council wants to be. So with that, I'll turn it over to our expanded staff team tonight. Tonight you'll hear a presentation led by Public Works Utilities Director Keith Reister, but with the, the strong support, and I'll thank this team for you know, dropping all the work, everything that wasn't essential about a month ago when we heard this, of this interest for, from, from council to brainstorm, conceptualize, and, and envision, and put forward tonight these projects that we can get done in the, the next few months. So I wanna thank them. Keith will, will, will uh, introduce them. Uh, they'll do most of the presentation. You'll also hear from our communications department and our police chief tonight and our finance director, because this effort is gonna take a citywide effort from many departments, and you'll hear about all of those, those departments and also our external partners and our transportation mobility board tonight. So with that long intro, I will turn it over to Keith and the team to walk I us through I think that's the third detail. time you said that, so. <laughs> Keith. Thank you, uh, Keith Reister, Public Works and Utilities Director. And the reason I'm up here tonight Standing at the, at, the, at the lectern is because we didn't have enough chairs at the table. So that's why I'm up here. And probably most of you didn't even know that this thing went up and down, um, which uh, we have an ADA compliant lectern, that's why. So I uh, appreciate the chance to be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> as Jim said, we last visited with you in the uh, waning days of November to talk about um, what we've historically done here and the work that's been done and is ongoing related to pedestrian and bike safety. And tonight we're going to revisit that topic and talk to you about some potential strategies. There's a wide spectrum of things that I think we can do, but as in anything, we have to figure out what those priorities are and how we're going to deliver those. Um, so we'll go through that tonight with a combination of staff. One of the things that um, I want to point out at the beginning is that we're, as you've heard from speakers, we're not the only community that's in this situation. So 10 years ago last month, January 14th of 2014, New York City was the first city in the United States to adopt Vision Zero to reduce to zero traffic-related fatalities. There are 45 cities which are currently stated that they are a Vision Zero attempted city. In that same time span of 10 years, overall in the United States, as well as in Colorado, traffic, pedestrian, and bicycle deaths have increased 30% during that same time span, including in those cities that we just talked about, the ones that are Vision Zero cities. So it's a nationwide problem that we're struggling with here. It's not just a Littleton problem. And our staff here is um, extremely uh, experienced and, and knowledgeable from across the nation, from other locations, other cities we've worked in, and all those kind of things. So we have a real strong depth of experience as well. So with that, I'm gonna just kind of jump right in. Um, our staff that's at the table is Aaron Human, our city traffic engineer, who you know. Uh, Kenna Davis, our transportation planner. Shane Roberts, our senior transportation planner. And in the rest of the row, we've got the finance director, the city engineer, the communications director. And we tried to get the police chief all the way in the back because if he and I were tag teaming for this, we'd be here until about 6 a.m., um, the way Doug and I go. So uh, we're going to work on that. So tonight's, uh, tonight's uh, agenda that we're going to want to discuss with you is uh, kind of the action timelines, um, our transportation safety strategies, um, what we think we can do in 2024, 
have proposed to do, uh, challenges that are gonna need to be overcome to deliver those kind of changes, and, and then a discussion amongst council um, about where, where we go from there. Um, all the pictures that you see here, by the way, are within Littleton in most cases. Um, of, of our city in most cases. So uh, you'll see that in the presentation. So with that, um, we're gonna just jump into the action timeline, so go right ahead. Um, so basically, when we visited with you in November, um, and we're gonna touch on this in the next few slides, is uh, over the last five years, we've dramatically increased the investment in all transportation safety here in the city. Um, prior to 2018, our annual investment in transportation safety was about, and in pavement maintenance, was about $1.4 million a year. That number this year is going to be $30 million, which obviously is a dramatic change. And in that process, we brought in a lot of money from outside as well. And every project that we've done, uh, where possible, we've included bicycle and pedestrian safety along the way. Sometimes tonight, you'll also hear me say pedestrian and bike safety, in that order because um, nationwide, as well as here in Colorado, and in our own statistical categories, um, pedestrians that are the highest likelihood, bikes after that. There's a, there's a significant difference in those when you look at the data. So what we're gonna propose tonight is we would continue to drive forward the existing $5 million worth of projects we have this year that are ours and development related uh, moving forward that are already planned for 2024 related to bike and pedestrian infrastructure, multimodal infrastructure. In those cases, we'll talk to you a little about those in more detail. We're also gonna potentially talk through you with the installation of 83 safety improvement locations across the city that are considered traffic calming, traffic safety locations. Um, we'll talk briefly about a, an enhanced communication strategy. We're gonna talk about police and education and enforcement role. We'll talk about some of the underlying structural organizational challenges delivering those services. Um, and then we're gonna talk about how we align those with the goals going forward. So this is the timeline that we proposed to you in November 2023. The, st the strategy that Littleton has used um, up in, you know, historically, as well as what's laid out by transportation professionals and called for in the Manual of Tr Uniform Traffic Control Devices is data collection um, and, and study prior to putting installations in, as well as getting public engagement. And that's what we've historically done here in Littleton, has been our approach. The original um, proposal that we gave you in the end of November was that we would jump into the communications campaign now alongside um, our communications team would be leading that with PD and with LPS schools. Um, we would start working with neighborhoods that there was going to potentially be pilot projects in to let them know it's coming, this is what's gonna happen, give us your feedback on what you think this is gonna look like, that we would be able to take that through about mid-May. We'd review those strategies with the TMB, um, we would still continue the implementation of projects that are already scheduled for this year. Um, and then we would bring that public engagement summary back to council in July. Um, and then we would also start the process in the spring of doing some evaluations for the existing school zones, what we're gonna, what I will call traffic safety calming installations that already exist in the city, as well as corridor study accelerations. And we'll explain why we have to do the corridor accelerations. Uh, police enforcement and education campaign, hopefully install school zone improvements before school starts, um, install pilot and pedestrian in the late half of the year, and then um, a line of resources going into the 2025 budget. That was the timeline we originally proposed to you back in November. This is the timeline that we are potentially proposing to you tonight. Obviously, the first thing doesn't change. We've already initiated the efforts on um, community um, outreach and engagement. Um, and this is important not just for schools, but community-wide. We've um, looked into installing 35 speed, speed feedback signs. You, you know, when you're driving down the road, you see that flash of your speed. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's been some changes in the regulations that are challenging that. Um, we would continue with the police education enforcement campaign that's starting now. Um, we would continue to implement the scheduled projects throughout the year. We would add in six bike pilot projects, 32 pedestrian pilot projects. Um, and in order to do that, we're gonna need to suspend the neighborhood traffic calming program until next year. It's the same staff. We only have so much staff. 
And uh, that's just the blank reality of it. We only have so many people in the barn. Um, we would continue to move forward on the school zones, the traffic calming installations, and the corridor and design studies. So when, when you get to that, the, the spending the uh, traffic calming program, what does that currently look like? What, what are you speaking for the audience? What are you speaking of? We, we have a whole slide on that that we'll come to. So we'll, we'll touch on that later. Um, we would continue. We would accelerate the engineering evaluation specifically for the school zones and the traffic calming installations, as well as accelerate some of the corridor and design studies. We would plan, if we're going to go out and install things, that we would set a date and time so that when, as we're doing that, the community knows when they can come back and give feedback to city council, and we would put that as a date certain in the future. We also would be providing other avenues throughout the process for people to give feedback. We would react to that and then continue to work on those things. Um, hopefully, um, we would be able to install improvements to school zones before school starts, but that has its own challenges so we would have to do that from a timeline so that's and then we would again identify resources for 2025 so as you can see the main differences in this schedule are we're basically going to say we're going to go out and in install things and then we're going to collect data and then we're going to get public comment that's the difference between these two schedules that's the simplest way to put it and so that's what we heard from council and so that's the schedule that you see in front of you. Uh, Ken is going to take this slide for us. Yeah. Um, so we touched on this in our November 28th uh, study session a little bit about our holistic approach. So as staff, we look at every single project, even if the project's made intent is not necessarily bike and pet improvements. We look at every project, though, and see what multimodal improvements we can include. Um, an example of this is our capital improvement program team put together our three-year pavement management plan. Um, our transportation group looked at that and uh, compared it with our transportation master plan and looked at where there was overlapping locations of multimodal improvements identified in the TMP. Um, and so that's how we came up with our list of corridor studies, which we'll touch on a little bit later, of we need to look at these corridors before we come in and do any pavement management because they're identified for bike lanes or pedestrian improvements. So, you know, we as a staff need to go ahead and do some planning and design work ahead of that so we can do it all at the same time. Um, we also look at, there's a philosophy in transportation planning called the six E's, equity, engagement, education, encouragement, evaluation, and engineering. Um, enforcement's also one of those. So we also look at all of these aspects and that's kind of how we've created this uh, presentation and our, um, our uh, strategy moving forward that engineering is just one component, but education, um, enforcement is also part of that conversation as well. Um, just a little bit of a reminder of our pro project implementation process. So typically we start with planning level studies. Um, this is really where we connect with the community, um, engage the community, figure out what they want for whether it's a corridor or a site specific project. Um, and it's high level, you know, high level recommendations and cost estimates so that we can use that to go out and get grants um, to then fund design and construction. And design is where it gets into the nitty gritty. So a planning level study might have a line on a map that says this is it should be a protected bike lane. In design, we really get into what does that design look like? What is the cross section of the street? Uh, what is the drainage implications, right of way impacts, those types of things. Um, construction, obviously you're constructing the infrastructure and then for maintenance, it's really maintaining it long term. Um, and with maintenance, as Keith has mentioned, there's some um, equipment impacts to that. So for protected bike lanes, we need specialized equipment to sweep and plow and staff to operate that. Um, funding is another uh, overarching element. So, you know, if it's grant funded, there's typically specific timelines that you have to meet for right of way or design um, to meet the grant requirements in order to get the money. Um, and then staff constraints, as we mentioned as well. Um, you know, we do utilize a lot of consultant support, but that still requires staff oversight. And we're always very involved with projects, um, regardless if we're doing it in-house um, or hire a consultant. So a consultant might do a lot of the technical analysis, but we are there to manage the project, do all of the funding reimbursements, and still lead the project from the city side. 
Thanks. Um, and as Ken was talking about the holistic approach, uh, another thing that we look to do is we look to utilize grant funding. And Keith had touched on before uh, about all the grant funding that the city has received in the last five years. And so we don't want to lose sight of that as we go, in, go into this proposed action. So if you've uh, been familiar with the city's grant situation, 2018 and prior, the city got about $200,000 a year in grant funding. Since 2019 and beyond, we now have $35 million in grant funding over the last five years, which represents about $60 million in projects. So as Keith mentioned, that's, that's quite a change. <clears throat> and that represents uh, $8 million that go directly toward bike and ped projects or projects with large bike and ped components. Uh, this is really thanks to a lot of our regional partners. As Dr. Dr. Cog was mentioned, CDOT is another uh, partner that provides a lot of this funding, as well as Arapahoe County Open Space. Um, and then we also want to thank, you know, think of our, our local jurisdictions that we partner with regularly as well. So when we get a grant-funded project, a lot of times that local match is spread out over several jurisdictions. So uh, that grant funding is a big part of it. Um, here's the catch with transportation grant funding, is that it's really, it's, it's only the roadways that are on the regionally significant roadway system that are eligible for these large uh, federal transportation grants. So uh, we'll look at the grant funded projects here later in the presentation, but you'll notice a lot, of, a lot of them are on our major roadways, right? They're on Bellevue, they're on Broadway, they're on Mineral, they're on Santa Fe, and that's because other roadways in the city of Littleton are not eligible for those federal dollars. So, <clears throat> so when one of the things that we've talked about before this in transportation as a whole is, and one of the specific challenges for Littleton as a whole is, Littleton's a pretty old city, especially for Colorado standards. It's a pretty old city. Our boundaries have been set for quite a long time. And so what's happened over time is things have grown up around us. And, and what's typical in an older city is everything you do when you go in and do a project is context-sensitive design. You can't, everything has to be because you have existing right-of-way conditions, drainage things that were built years ago, all of that. So everything we take into account when we look at those projects. So as we go into potential policy trade-offs going forward, right-of-way constraints is always going to be a challenge. Um, you know, we either have to acquire right-of-way to expand things, or and that doesn't come for free. And uh, those are things that we're going to have to encounter. Uh, parking versus, for example, bicycle facilities, which was mentioned earlier tonight, is going to be part of the discussion. Um, there's high comfort facilities is what you would call um, more enhanced pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and there'll be additional maintenance that comes with those. Um, there's also a big difference between quick pilot projects and permanent installations and the cost that goes with that. Um, we have pretty limited parking enforcement resources here in the city, and that's, that's, his, that's been our historical approach. Um, we also, in some of these areas, one of the things we have to consider is things around um, our neighborhood centers, whether they be parks or whether they be activity centers that have a big influx perhaps on the weekends whether it's related to events or sports or those kind of things and how that will impact that as well. Um, is, and uh, one of the things if, as our acceleration, as I noted earlier, is that our neighborhood traffic calming program, which we'll talk about, we're going to have to really set that back a little bit because it's the same staff delivering the services. So go ahead. Um, programmatic cost factors. Um, so... Basically, we have some overall background for you. So in 2020, um, we worked our way over the last few years to adopt the city's first ADA um, transportation, ADA implementation plan, which was required many years ago, but Littleton finally adopted it about a year ago. In that process, we brought in a firm to look at all of the city's pedestrian infrastructure, every location, and identify if it met the current ADA standards for width, slope, grades and ramps. There was over 5,000 non-ADA compliant locations that were identified in that study. When that was prepared in 2021, that number was, to fix all of those, was estimated to be in excess of $81 million. We have 15.1 miles of missing sidewalk and we have 30, almost 33 miles of narrow sidewalk. This city was built during a time when you can see it when you go to older portions of, say, like Sheridan and other areas where you have an attached curb with like an 18-inch sidewalk on it, which was acceptable at the time that that was put in. And so we have, obviously, a lot of that here in this city. So the total amount, we have chipped away at this. Obviously, as we go through projects, we're working on this and we're site-specific things depending on requests and that kind of stuff. That $82 million doesn't include 
anything related to areas where we would need to get additional right of way to widen things. It doesn't include any litigation that would be tied to that, as well as the consultant and staff time to do design. So you're looking at that plus scale to today's inflation numbers, that's going to be a, over $100 million for sure. On the bicycle side, in the bike and pedestrian plan portion of the TMP um, in 2019, we uh, identified just under $20 million in potential bike improvements with a potential for approximately 31 miles of improvements. That's all called out in the existing TMP. Those as well don't include right-of-way acquisition, the staff um, and consultant design time, as well as any right-of-way acquisition and litigation as well. To give you an overall picture. So between those two numbers in today's dollars, um, to address all the stuff that's in, in the currently existing TMP in the ADA plan, you're probably looking at $130 million in today's dollars to do that is the data that we already have, so. Yeah, and so just to touch on a collaboration with partners, and we'll hear from our communications department and police department, as Keith mentioned before, but, um, you know, with this effort, we are working with internal and external partners with, you know, public works, communications, police, city manager's office, um, LPS. We just had a lunch uh, earlier this week actually to talk about all of this, these communication strategies. Um, our traffic safety committee, which is a multidisciplinary group, meets bi-weekly. So this includes staff from public works, police, city manager's office, um, Communications. Communications, thank you. <laughs> um, so we meet bi-weekly and we discuss all of our resident requests from the neighborhood traffic calming program, any severe crashes, and any other ongoing safety conversations. Um, so for example, you know, Arapahoe Community College might talk with police about some safety issues around campus and we'll discuss that at the traffic safety committee. Um, so as part of this, we've created this bike and pedestrian safety campaign. We are labeling this the Safer Streets Littleton campaign, and this will be on social media. And again, it works with Communication Police Public Works LPS. Um, one thing to note, TMB is not on this slide, and it's not that we forgot about them. Uh, we see them as having a large ongoing role in all of this work, um, especially moving forward with your direction. Um, and then just to note, you know, we also work with our community and regional partners, so advocacy groups like Bicycle Colorado or Vibrant Littleton locally, CDOT as a funding partner and also as um, an agency that uh, owns certain roadways within Littleton. Um, LPS, PTOs are going to be important to implement a lot of our safety and education work. Um, and then South Suburban Parks and Recreation District as they maintain all of our parks and trails. Right. Um, and to build on what Ken was talking about with the collaboration is, you know, we have both these internal and external partners. Uh, and as the mayor mentioned earlier, sometimes uh, that makes processes from coming to an idea, from an idea to construction a little bit slow. But it's important that we continue the collaboration. So internally, if we build a roadway as public works um, and our streets crew can't maintain it and PD can't safely enforce it, then we're not, we're just creating other problems and fixing one problem. Um, also, you know, in thinking about our external partners, uh, we really want to collaborate with them as well because we know that when we collaborate with other organizations whether that art be RTD or Dr. Cog that we will long term we will have a better project because of that collaboration and the many perspectives that come along uh, with those different perspectives. Uh, we also know that um, that if we don't want to create these unintended consequences just like we don't internally we don't want to do that for other jurisdictions or uh, other agencies that we work with so that collaboration piece is really key. <clears throat> That's been part, go ahead, you can jump to the next one. That's been part of our ongoing uh, strategy up to this point. So, Kelly, do you want to chat to this or do you want me to? <laughs> I kind of expected the baton to bounce back like that as well. So, um, the communications staff, Kelly's team, um, as well as the police team and our team have spent a lot of time together really talking about opportunities to roll out some supplemental uh, multimodal safety campaign that would include bicycle, pedestrian, those kind of things across the city. It would be primarily city-led with LPS and sharing information across their supplemental platforms, newsletters, as many outlets as possible. We would begin that in the spring. The, the group would work, the teams would work through that. And then as a whole, we would be regrouping in the summer, see how that went, see what we learned from that process, and look at how we would develop going into the fall school year. Um, we also would be working as part of that on general education and awareness for the community about policy priorities, projects, implications for residential neighborhoods, as well as just safety in general related to all users of the right-of-way that are out there. Uh, 
um, since they're, that is an important part of the component. Uh, the content's going to include all the things you see on the right, the usual things of you know flyers, uh, social media videos, and the usual. One of the things that we put on there is that um, right, right now it can be a little bit of a challenge to find all of the content um, in different places on the website, so we um, we we be working on some consolidation of that so that the prioritization you'd be able to see that more easily um, from a public presence. I know Doug told me already that I could have the baton in this one. It's it's a first time for me to let the police chief let me speak in his stead, so it might be the last. So, well, at least we have it on video. So, um, it, you know, enforcement, police is, is, we think of them as enforcement a lot of times, but it's enforcement and education as well. Um, they play a huge role in um, not only doing the enforcement, but also educating drivers, new drivers, older drivers, users of pedestrians, bikes, everybody out there. They play a big role, and people react to that as well. They, 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 look, they look to our police officer for information, for background, and they trust that source. Um, so some of the things that would be included here, summer kickoff event at Bemis Library with L LPS of summer break to talk about you know, safety, education, those kind of things driven by the police. Um, several events across multiple locations, encouraging kids to bring bikes, you know, bike safety checks, kind of like a bike rodeo type of thing so that people can get in there as well as give out some of those other things that sometimes kids don't have that help them when they're out there riding their bikes, which include um, helmets, uh, bike bells, reflectors, flashing lights, all of those kind of things. We'd also um, look towards increased enforcement around schools with radar speed trailers um, and uh, police officers doing more enforcement work and education work in, school, in and around school zones um, in the AM and PM peaks when their schools are coming and going. Uh, we also would um, work across the safety campaign that we talked about on the last slide that would really look into the social media aspects, but then how, do, um, our, how does our police department, um, our community uh, resource officers, how do we interconnect with the educational curriculum at LPS in supporting their mission as well as combining that with our mission to get greater information out to students and families um, to help them feel better about um, all the modes of transportation to schools. Um, and bringing that forward as part of the process. Keith, pardon me for one, one second. I can't let the chief off quite so, so easily. Some questions we've had from council are around some specifics in the enforcement area in terms of capacity that we have and how we're building in kind of more, more, uh, more specifics around scheduling and how that enforcement is structured within the police department, so if the chief could comment on that for a moment. Sure, um, thanks Jim, and uh, Keith, you're doing a heck of a good job, just want you to know. So, um, a couple things up here I wanna talk about real quickly is, um, as staffing allows, is kind of drawn some angst, and rightfully so, it's probably not the right wording. Um, obviously, the, the folks out there in the police cars that are doing the traffic enforcement uh, do that as one of their main goals or one of their main duties in, in their daily operations, uh, but it's as call load allows as well. So obviously those are the same personnel that are handling the emergency and non-emergency calls for service, of which we had 61,000 of those last year, so that kind of gives you an idea of what the officers are doing. But we also have proactive units like traffic unit that they're, uh, one of their main functions is to do enforcement, but they also investigate all the traffic crashes that occur in the city when they're on duty as well. So. It's a give and take. But what we've done immediately is in an, an attempt to address some of these community concerns is we've uh, added some overtime opportunities for personnel to immediately begin doing enforcement, only enforcement, uh, so they don't have to be answering the calls for service. They're out there just to do enforcement, especially in the school zones, beginning last week and will continue through uh, the end of the school year. So we do have officers that are doing speed enforcement in the school zones. <clears throat> right now, that's their only job, their only priority. Uh, and it'd be in the a.m. and p.m. Uh, time frames on coming and going from school. So if you're picking kids up or dropping kids off, make sure uh, distracted driving is one of our focuses, speeding, obviously, all the traffic control uh, devices and situations, whether it's red lights or stop signs, we'll be focusing on that, focusing on some of those crosswalk concerns, obviously. Um, as a father who drops a kid off every day at school, uh, the traffic driving is appalling by the parents. My kid goes to high school, so the students are 
pretty bad, but the parents are worse. So part of that's going to be education. We talk about education from a law enforcement, law enforcement perspective. Uh, we concentrate <clears throat> more traditionally on the drivers. Like our education is uh, through uh, issuing these little pieces of paper that cost money called citations, uh, which is unfortunate for if you get one, but that's uh, the main deterrent, I guess. Uh, but also, you know, that second piece now and expanding our role in an educational piece in our partnership with the schools. Um, I know there were some comments earlier during public comment on uh, well, it's not one way or the other. It's not the responsibility of the driver or the pedestrian or the bicyclist. It's everyone's responsibility equally uh, to pay attention to what's going on around them. Um, it's like, you know, when it's lightning outside, we pay attention and we don't, we do things to protect ourselves when we're on bikes or walking or driving. We need to have the same type of awareness and we will work with communications and public works to, to build that education piece as well. But enforcement has begun specifically in those areas and we'll continue to do it throughout the end of the year. Any questions for law enforcement? I'm gonna turn it back over to Keith. Good, all right, let me put this way down here. Patrick got one. Doug, I, I do because I've been harping on slowing traffic down. Uh, how many tickets would you say we've issued since uh, you've kicked off that campaign? I don't have those numbers yet. That is one thing. We're going to track all the data so that we'll give you um, a report um, as we go continue through this. I'm sure you, you will all be getting regular reports. Uh, part of that will be staffing hours, number of citations, number of warnings, uh, number of accidents that occur in these locations. Uh, so those types of statistics as we go forward. Thank you. Um, you're going to take this one, I believe. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about the kind of communication strategy and the enforcement strategy. Now we're going to talk about our capital project. So here is kind of a list of everything that we are going to talk through. Um, just to note that, you know, a lot of this is uh, can be accomplished with our current or funding that we've found and with our current staffing. Um, some of this, though, um, is kind of above and beyond that staffing uh, capacity allows right now. So uh, Keith will be talking about that a little more later. Um, one thing to note too, as you know, grants, the continued pursuit of grants is the, the bottom bullet point. Um, we do have some limitations with grants just because of staffing capacity and the amount of time that it takes to uh, go after grants and then implement grants once we receive them. Um, so we really are looking forward to updating the transportation master plan um, to really define um, our grant strategy moving forward and, and how we're going after grants and how we prioritize grants and um, how we staff those as well. So Kenna mentioned uh, pilot projects as part of our capital strategy. So I'm going to touch specifically on the bike pilot projects for 2024. So this map to your left is just what we see as the low hanging fruit bike projects uh, that we could go out very soon and put down a pilot project and be confident that we would be making an improvement because we have enough data, we have enough understanding of the context, right? Or we have uh, enough understanding of how the street operates to make sure that we're gonna be improving the situa situation rather than reacting and creating a situation that could potentially be worse. Um, so I just wanna kinda of touch on each of these briefly, but we're happy to dive into details if you have any questions. So starting on the left there, uh, the blue with Tule Lake and Sheridan Boulevard. So our transportation master plan calls for a parallel bike route to Bowles Avenue. If you've ever tried to ride a bike on Bowles Avenue, it's not very comfortable. And from our perspective, there's not a whole lot of available right away. So it's hard to understand just from, you know, an initial look how we're going to fit a, a bike facility in there. So as an interim step, we're looking at making a parallel route along Tule Lake. Um, to the bottom right, kind of swooping around counterclockwise, uh, Pennsylvania Street and Phillips Ave, those both connect to Powell Middle School. Uh, we have enough data collection and enough understanding of how the street operates there that we think we could install a protected bike lane um, and not mess with property <coughs> access um, or create any situations that we think might be unfavorable. If you've driven down Pennsylvania Street, you'll notice that a lot of the houses actually don't front Pennsylvania Street and that lends to some of the high speeds that we've seen on that street. So that's one of the low hanging fruit that we see. Bouncing back up to the top left, uh, Bellevue Avenue and Irving Street. These are actually two incidents where we had citizen complaints and went out and collected data, and, and these are responses to that. Irving Street specifically, we got complaints from residents uh, west of Irving that there was speeding taking place on Irving. 
And so we went out and collected data and it was much higher than our thresholds that, that we would expect on that street. So last year in 2023, we went out and striped a bike lane, uh, collected more data. Data is still above our threshold. So this year we'd be looking to uh, improve that, kind of shift the cross section a little bit and install some more traffic calming as we update that project. I thought I saw a question. I actually have a question about okay, that with sure. the with the striping of lanes and you know with the intention of slowing people down mm -hmm. um, you know I think as many of the audience members have mentioned that that's not necessarily you know a real world result when you see people on the road you know right. it's it's oftentimes drivers don't even see the the painted lane and so I think part of the you know and I'm not a traffic engineer so but I think some of the infrastructure designing some of those streets that to actually uh, narrowing them um, rather than putting a um, a buffered lane down there. What I mean, what's the difference between uh, extending the sidewalk and making the sidewalk 10 or 12 feet wide with the bike lane up there? Uh, that gets rid of the uh, we need to uh, change our plows and have our street sweeper go through there. I mean, and that that narrows the the roadway. It has it you know has the effect of cars perhaps driving slower, um, gets the bikes out of there. I mean, what can you talk to me about that? Yeah, sure. I'm not so, saying specific any of these ones. I mean, when we get to Windermere specifically with that, I'm because I'm more familiar with that. But sure, yeah. So I can tell you. So these projects specifically, we're looking looking to implement these starting in April, right? As soon as we we're pretty sure that that snow is not going to be an issue anymore. Um, with a sidewalk, that would be a little bit longer of a project. So these of are kind of quick win. But yeah, as far as kind of you know extending that sidewalk and creating what we would call a cycle track, which is a, a bike facility that's on the same level as the sidewalk, that is kind of the gold standard when it comes to bike facilities. And we have one of those planned down uh, near the Santa Fe and Mineral Development on Platte River Parkway. And so you know there's other things we have to consider too, such as drainage, right away, things like that. Um, so it's it's all very feasible, and from a maintenance standpoint, that is much simpler than you know for the equipment we have now. It's simpler to maintain that than it is a uh, protected bike lane. But there's obviously higher higher costs on the front end. Again. I'm sure there's higher costs, and like specifically with Windermere, you know, we talk about right of way acquisition. That's I mean, that's a wide road. I don't I can't imagine there would need to be any right of way acquisition. You can narrow those lanes. Um, I mean, the parking lane I could fit almost two cars, or the the parking section there. And so, I think you know we need to look be a little more innovative to some of the things that hey how how we can do this to to actually narrow the roadway um, in places like that. It's important for us, I'm gonna to add to that discussion, Mayor. It's important for us a couple of things. I, I'm totally supportive of those kind of actions, road diets and that kind of thing. We also have to make sure that one of the big components that we take into effect in the MUTCD is emergency services access. That, that is one of the biggest components that is part of our development review process is emergency services access. And that's one thing that we really you know, they'll certainly tell you we can't compromise. So that's where sometimes the lane width can be a challenge, and in, in especially in a contextual city like this where we have existing conditions. So in all of the situations we're doing that, we are looking at those options. You'll see a slide here in a few minutes which will show you the cost difference um, to do something like the treatment that you just discussed versus, say, an on-lane bike lane. Yeah, I, saw, I remember seeing that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And I'll just uh, also put a kind of bookmark here because I believe you'll be hearing about the importance of accelerating some of our corridor studies. And I believe that's where staff can really explore the alignment questions, the sidewalk questions, because that's where you look at the drainage. That's where you, where you look at what's possible and feasible systematically in longer stretches of our roads um, and can also, you know, have the, the connectivity that we, that we, we want with, with, with other roads. So when you see those corridor studies, the term might not sound exciting, but the more I've learned about it, the more that's really key for the, the larger scale improvements that we'll need to make on some of our larger collectors. Yeah, and, and I mean, my, we're kind of getting off track here with where we were, but my point was, you know, when we were looking at trying to slow speeds down, you know, putting a line of paint down, didn't do it. I mean, it's not surprising to do it. I mean, we, we, we know that that's the pattern and we know other communities have gone through that as well. So I think that's kind of this like, well, if we know it's not going to work, why even do it in the first place? Sure. Yeah. And so this is, um, so we laid down paint in 2023 and, you know, like has been mentioned, we want to be very data driven. And so as we go back to Irving this year, what we're going to do is install other traffic calming features, not just striping. And so we don't know exactly what that looks like, uh, but we do know it's not just going to be striping. Okay, thanks. So. Council Member. So I, I would like to understand kind of the connectedness of these projects because um, I feel like um, 
um, you know, uh, pools of tranquility in the middle of, uh, you know, sure. um, oceans of sharks is not going to actually create the change that we want. The, I've lived in the neighborhood where the Bellevue uh, and Irving Street are, and Irving Street is connected to Centennial Elementary, and, and you know, my children have walked up and down that street on their way to school. So I understand the connectedness of Irving. And you mentioned the connectedness of the Pennsylvania one to Powell, and yep. so that makes sense to me. Some of the other ones feel um, kind of disconnected. Sure. Do you mind ad addressing that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, we can start with Bellevue, and, and that one is a little bit disconnected. That one is really an opportunity to, to do something where we see that there is a very wide roadway, and we can install something that's recommended in the TMP, right, even though right now it doesn't connect to anything. We do have uh, future plans. We're looking, we've, we've applied for with past grant opportunities and are continuing to pursue this uh, with a shared use path along Bellevue east of there that would accommodate both bikes and pedestrians on one facility. Facility. Um, so that you're not seeing that there, but that's something we're continuing to pursue. Sure. Mike? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Thule Lake, so you can't see it on here, but where that ends, right at Blue Sage Drive, uh, there's a trail through the park there, and then we're looking to make, uh, there's a crossing on Lowell just north of Bulls Avenue that uh, that would connect to, and then we're looking, we haven't determined the street quite yet, and this would be part of a study that we have funding for in 2026 to look both at Bulls as well as that parallel route more comprehensively, but to cut through that, uh, that neighborhood there west of Bulls Grove Park, and then connect down to the trails there to get to downtown. So that's one, one link in the piece to get from the west side of the city to downtown Littleton. And we probably could have better, done a better job of showing that as, as it relates to the whole network. Thank you for taking the time to explain sure. it to me. And then the last one I'll end on because it was, it was brought up and I think it's thematic of what we're going into is Windermere. And so um, north of Bellevue, if you've been on Windermere, there's lots of pavement there. Uh, there's not a whole lot, there's not a very dense land use. And so that's one where we're pretty confident we can go in, use temporary infrastructure to install a protected bike lane and not have any adverse effects. Then once you get south of Bellevue, things get a little more complicated, right? There's houses fronting the street, there's park uses, things like that. And so um, as we, in a few slides, we'll get into corridor studies and that's one where we feel like we need more study before we can just go in and put something on the ground because what we don't want to do is put something on the ground and create a situation that's dicey right drivers don't understand what's going on cyclists don't understand and then we create a you know a conflict point that wasn't there before so and w when we get into corridor studies I can see some some dissatisfaction with that but when we get into corridor studies I'll kind of explain how that works so <clears throat> And then, um, just so if you aren't familiar with these bike facilities on the previous page, um, we had mobility lanes, buffered bike lanes, and protected bike lanes. And when we're looking at these, uh, these kind of quick action projects, these are the facilities we would be looking at. So mobility lanes, this is something we've tried in the Beaumar South neighborhood on Blue Sage Drive specifically. Um, this is something that we would, where there's no sidewalks in a lot of our older neighborhoods, not just narrow sidewalks, but no sidewalks. And so in this particular instance, we look to create a space for people who aren't driving in a car where they can have an area of the roadway to walk and bike and we know in Blue Sage in particular that's a pretty popular activity for people to walk and bike there so it's not ideal but what we're trying to do is to separate out the different modes so there's kind of a clear space right um, buffered bike lanes so you guys are all familiar with the bike lane a buffered bike lane is just creating more space between the travel lane and the bike lane and then of course a protected bike lane is a buffered bike lane with some sort of vertical deflection in that buffer space now you might be asking why not just go if you can fit a buffered bike lane why not just go straight to a protected bike lane and when we have the opportunity to do a corridor study and design we would certainly do that but in situations where we're looking for kind of quick fast track projects we might put a buffered bike lane in first to see how uh, people on the roadway react Act, how users of the roadway react before we put in that other element and create a potentially dangerous situation. So, yeah. So Shane mentioned our uh, bike pilot projects. So our pedestrian pilot projects. Uh, so Trailmark Parkway crossings. Um, it, sh it shows as a line on the map, but really it's eight sp different crossings along Trailmark Parkway. Um, this is a project that we've actually had ongoing conversations with the HOA for a couple of years now, and we've received some um, more recent complaints through our neighborhood traffic calming program. Um, and so this would be upgrading those crossings um, to be compliant. They're currently non-compliant with the MUTCD. Um, so this would not be any ADA upgrades or any concrete work, um, but just upgrading signage and striping. 
Uh, the trail connectivity study, so Littleton Linkages is our trail study that has been ongoing for about 14 months. It's an Arapahoe County open space funded study. Um, we've worked extensively with South Suburban Parks and Recreation District um, and identified new trail improvements, existing trail improvements, and crossing location improvements. Um, so we would be installing about four crossing improvements that ranked high in priority from that study and that align with our pavement management plan as well. Um, and then our school crosswalks, uh, this would be striping new crosswalks around schools that don't currently exist. So there's about 20 of these uh, school-wide, or city-wide, excuse me. Um, and again, this would not be upgrading any ADA facilities, but just striping crosswalks. So one of the things that we've talked about is um, this uh, Euclid Avenue resurfacing and potential raised cross pedestrian crossings is currently in the transportation plan in the pavement management plan for 2026. We, we could potentially accelerate a project like this to be done this year. So what you would see is there's gonna be a resurfacing in there that's a paving project, mill and overlay. We'd be creating a raised pedestrian crossing which you see on the right and then an enhanced bike lane as well, as well as ADA ramps and those kind of, at the intersections. What you see up there is a half a mile. That's a half a mile of roadway. So the cost to do that with, without widening the sidewalks is about $2 million. Because you gotta remember the asphalt going in there is not free. So that's already part of it. And then the second part of that is if you wanted to widen the sidewalks like um, we just talked about previously, you're looking at, at least probably at least another half a million in that half mile. So this is a comparative example of something that we can accelerate. One of the challenges that comes for us is if, if, this, if you want to build something like this this summer, it has to be bid in the next 25 days in order to get it out on the street so work can be done. In terms of actual construction, uh, partially that is the reality of the, both the contractor and consultant market out there. So this is an example of a project that we could move forward that was scheduled for two years out that would enhance this particular corridor and it would um, allow for a place for, to showcase where you want to go. This is much more of what would be called a complete street design, um, which is we always look at that as an opportunity in all of our designs here and, and then it goes into the context question of how do you make that work as an example. For, in, in, in this particular case, you know, to widen the sidewalks, you got to come in. Because if not, you're going to go out there and start, you're going to have to pay every one of those property owners for a few feet off the front of their, of front of their lot. Um, we can't just take that without paying them. And that's not the simplest process, but we can do it. So it would be, the, the sidewalk would be coming in. So this is an example of what you can do. So basically, if you want to do that, a complete street and narrow it, you're looking at about $5 million a mile right now. And that's comparative data looking at our neighbors as well. One of the other questions too, I, I want to give an example about why doing some of the corridor studies are important. And I'm going to use an example of another community in the last month. So um, I had to visit another community um, that will go unmentioned but starts with B and ends with R that's up north that is um, very proud of their infrastructure. And what I was traveling in an area where it was kind of a mixed use of sort of a business park as well as mixed use residential next, next door to it. And what they had decided to do was they had installed um, two, one is a mid-block crossing and one was an additional crossing at an intersection about 150 feet up from it that was completely done with delineators and striping in the road, including in the center. And the only concrete improvements and such that were done were putting, putting ramps in on the curbs. So the sidewalks dropped to an ADA ramp. So as we talked about that with the staff, and I brought that to the staff, we looked at it in Google Earth, just like we always do, and it, it looks pretty good. The interesting part was that night when I was over there, um, I, stopped to take, I stopped and took pictures. And they were terrible because it was dark out. I was trying to do it in my headlights. But one of the things we noticed after the fact was because that particular roadway, they didn't do the corridor study, what, it was a day after it snowed. And both, all of the pedestrian ramps were under six inches of water they had become the low point of the drainage system. And so that's why when we look at a corridor and doing, doing engineering, that's why we have to look at those kind of things because someone who's mobility impaired, and anytime you have 
poor weather, that's a non-usable crossing. So those are the kind of things that we have to consider. Another example of that in our own community is the dip that's between the museum and the, and the library. It, that's there for drainage, but it's never going to work for drainage. It's never going to work for pedestrians. It's never going to work for cars. But it was installed at a time in the past. And so those are an example of our own community where we've done that in the past. So trying it's to mix and match. Very effective at slowing people down, though, and watching them lose their undercarriage. That's it's very correct. entertaining. People love dips. <laughs> I don't think so. So one of the things that, you know, one, one of the things, and that's why we have to look at, in a lot of situations, the design and engineering. And that's why, for example, as Shane said, you trying to get a buffered bike lane in there first before you do a permanent installation makes a big difference because you don't want to create a situation where, you know, a cyclist is just whipping over an ice skating rink, for example, or a pedestrian. So that's just a real world example of something that I just personally observed related to why we have to do some of that study. Go ahead. I, I had a couple of questions yeah, absolutely, on, John. On, that, on that slide. Mm -hmm. When you said a half mile, I assume you're not referring just to the diagram that's up there, because, or are you referring no. to the whole way to Broadway? From yeah, it would Alotti. be Alotti to Broadway. We okay, just thank you. we just showed a, a section of that. I, Sorry, that's what I, I was hoping because I'm like that's about 500 feet, Keith. So I know, but we had, wanna... I, I couldn't. We're both small. We had to yeah. shrink it down. <laughs> it's so just so a long. You and I could both fit on okay. the lane road there. Um, so. And and specifically with this location, you know, I, you know, my kid goes to Euclid. Um, I'm familiar with this location. Is a raised crossing right there the best location? Because I would say more people cross on Alotti um, on the north side um, uh, of uh, Lottie and Euclid there. So uh, that, that's that's where Officer Redmond's out there. That's where I don't I rarely see anyone crossing at that front. That is a door. perfect example of why data and engineering in the, advance is yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Especially in something like a school yeah. zone. So I was so, gonna I was gonna say the exact same thing. That's right. not where people are crossing. And there's a whole nother school mm -hmm. a quarter mile up where we need to think about people going to the options campus. So in, <clears throat> in my mind, um, Thinking this through is important, right? And that's you know that's what I was getting into. You know, we want to see quick, immediate fixes as well, but sometimes we don't want to do it incorrectly. And like you know, perhaps that might be not the best um, mm -hmm. location for well, that. Well, in this case, this would normally be designed and looked at over the next two years because it's in 2026, currently in the pavement management program. So this is an example of something you could accelerate, but these are the complications that come with accelerating something where you're going to be doing a fair amount of construction, as an example. So, okay. go ahead. Thanks. Um, I got this slide. So one of the things that we've discussed is um, adding, we looked across the city and, and we, we, we looked at adding 35 speed feedback signs around schools. These are ones that would be uh, solar fed, so they wouldn't, would, some would end up being permanent, some would be movable to other locations. This would do two things. It would um, warrant, you know, give motorists direct feedback as to how they're going, how their speeds are going. And then secondly, these are also data collection devices for us and police to understand what the data looks like in a particular roadway and in a particular section um, to bear out where we might need to look at additional improvements. One of the things that we, we know this from a technical standpoint is the effectiveness of these signs does decline over time um, as drivers get used to them. We've also been thrown a little bit of a curveball with the new MUTCD that was recently released. So I'm going to use an example of the one that's on Prince right out here. When you're driving northbound on Prince, right on the other side of Geneva Village, there's a speed feedback sign. That's a traditional one that has the red and, the red and blue flashing in it. Under the new standard, the red and blue flashing is not allowed, and you also have to have a speed sign on that sign. So you're adding two signs so the driver can see, here's the speed you're going, and here's what it's supposed to be, right? So one of the things we do worry about when we're, as professionals, is sign pollution across the city. That's a very real fact, and that's one of the things we've tried to work on over time as a profession. The second part of that is why it's more complicated around schools is because the new MUTCD requiring that sign that shows you the speed is going to require another digital sign, not a static sign, because the speed changes during the day with a school zone. So on a post in a school zone, you're going to have the digital sign that shows the speed. You're going to have the accepted speed limit at that time, and it, it may be lower during school hours and higher during other hours, which is pretty standard in a school zone. 
and we would have to put those. So you're doubling up the digitals on those. So this is one of the things we looked at. We're looking at a quarter million dollars to do that. We'd be able to install these. They're not going to be a loss because we can always move them around um, in the future to other locations. But we've been throwing a little bit of curveball. And even if we go and order them tomorrow morning, we're looking at three months before they get here. That's just the supply chain issues that exist in the United States at the moment. So that's one of our challenges that is a curveball just related to a project like this. And you can see the locations where those would be, those speed feedback signs. Plus it would be collecting data for us going forward in those locations. Keith, um, mm -hmm. is there data that shows that these feedback signs actually reduce fatality or when they're installed? Um, the one thing I can say is that a, a sign on the side of the road and paint on the road will never stop a vehicle interacting with something. I know that for I know that for a fact. These signs do increase driver awareness, and that is it's really an education issue. And you're trying to you're trying to um, get drivers to be more attentive, be aware of their speed, and do a proper speed. This just is one technique to do that. It's just one in the toolbox. It's a potential potential tool in the toolbox. Hey Keith, mm -hmm. you know, thanks for bringing up those speed signs because there is one on Bowles uh, just past. Uh, Bomar there he heading into the city and I'm you know shocked by the speed that's coming down there we have data now probably for over a year on that sign are we doing anything with it uh, I, I've never seen a cop pulling by over on that section there um, what so are we doing with this data okay so I can speak to I can speak to the public works and infrastructure side obviously none of us any of us would build bowls today like it is with attached sidewalks, with narrow, with fences butted up to it, and a small right-of-way. We would never build that today. Also with questionable drainage. So when we're doing that situation, we've secured outside federal dollars to do a corridor study to, to, to look at what we would do in there in terms of how do we fit all of those other resources into the roadway so that we can deal with the traffic, we can deal with the bikes and pedestrians safely, and we can deal with what, what's the issue, the property owner issues along the side. We've secured outside federal money for that to leverage our local dollars to do that in the future. That's also a road where it's got a lot of concrete in it, which is not the cheapest replacement. So whether you go back in with concrete or you go back in with something else, it's, uh, an existing concrete road is, is a little bit more expensive when you go into the rehabilitation or replacement process. In relation to the data question for police, you know, what that data comes back to is the traffic safety committee, both our traffic division as well as um, the police traffic division, and when um, the police enforcement staff um, can, can work as own, they do. I would ask the chief just to comment on the council member's question, just, to, just about enforcement generally, and I think, you know, our plans, thanks to this year's budget, are to augment what we have, but what are the challenges and what, how do we re respond to an, an issue like that? So specifically with that location, the, the challenges there are not just what Keith was talking about from an engineering perspective, but if you think about an enforcement operation for law enforcement, we have to have a place where we can observe the violation safely and then get into traffic to make that stop, which is incredibly challenging along that corridor. There's really no place for us to, to put up like a speed enforcement operation is very challenging. So um, it, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it, it is it is very difficult in that location. Um, but as far as uh, um, enhancing staffing levels and things like that, like we talked about, yes, um, thank you to council for the 24 expansion of the police department. One of the things that we did identify long before these issues were being brought up uh, currently is the need to staff more of those proactive units, the traffic unit being one of those. So we are working toward enhancing that staffing. You'll hear about that more next week during the study session, but uh, we are moving toward that. That's your question. Yeah, yeah, I think just presence a lot of time will slow traffic down. I mean, right at Coventry, you can put an officer right there and, and just shoot them uh, with the speed gun and slow them down, you know? I mean, anything, shoot them later after you caught them, but slow them down. It's just, I think we all agree it needs to slow down. There are other options too, you know? I mean, I, throughout the, the ugly photo radar type thing, you know, but in places that have photo radar, 
can't say. I mean, studies will show different things, and we used to have photo of red light enforcement here in Littleton. And like the speed signs, it when it first went in, it was pretty effective, and then over the years, it became less and less and less effective, and ultimately may have contributed to some accidents because people would slam on brakes and things like that to avoid, you know, so it's a little bit photo radar in locations <clears throat> can be shown, especially mobile photo radar can be shown to reduce because if you know that van's there or that device is there, people slow down because you're going to get a ticket. So um, those are other options to explore as we move forward, but uh, we don't have that capacity right now. So, oh, sorry, on the last slide, how many of those devices are you saying we would buy with that money? The locations that we potentially identified are 35. Oh, 35 mm -hmm. of those machines. Yep. Is it possible to buy less and move them around more? Or is, uh, what does moving them around involve? Uh, the, the, so we could certainly order less. There's no question about that. Moving them around more is going to be challenging. We only have a small crew in our own traffic operations staff. And these would be the same folks that are dealing with traffic signals every day, traffic signal outages, all of those kind of things, traffic signal timing. And that's the same crew that would be hanging them on the post, taking them off the post, moving them to the next post. Um, so that would be, it, we would be trading off other things. So, and there's not really, one of the challenges specifically I'll speak to on this type of installation here in the front range is there's, for the last decade plus, there's really only been one contractor. We all have the same contractor, and they all have the same problem that we do, finding traffic tech technicians in the labor force. So this is one of the challenges that we have as a, as a professional community in Colorado is we're, we're, we're somewhat limited by the pipeline that we can use to execute work in this particular area. And Council Member, I would point out too, I know the staff mentioned that they are for, for speed awareness for drivers, but these are also what will give us the most strategic approach, that data for understanding where other improvements can be made. If the team can place these, can place, I'm going to make numbers up because that's a real smart thing for city managers to do, um, you know, five of these on all of the approaches to a certain school, you can get data on speed and volume of trips and how are these vehicles getting to the school and where are the problems, which helps us to say, this is where we need to spend money as opposed to more of the scatter shot where we, just because um, streets are near the school, we think that's where we need to put the, the improvements. But so not speaking for the engineers, but I know that that, that data is, is important for investments. And again, this is, these kinds of, of uh, signs and features wouldn't just be used for this year. This is part of that sustained, ongoing investment for um, you know that heightened bike and pet safety. So I'll stop there. Turn it back to the staff. And quickly look, looking at that map, you know, seeing some of looking at these get, gather, uh, gathering these data. Um, how much with streets that have changes in speed limits? How much does that contribute to? You know, if it's, I'm looking at a lot of here, it's 30 uh, uh, above Ridge and 25 south. And then it, it, I mean, if people are going through that, are they going to sustain this higher speed limit? I mean, why do we have all these changes along <clears throat> one route there? I can tell you that a lot of stuff on Alati was installed many years ago in the hope of slowing traffic. You know? We don't have, and there's not data that was collected at that time when those installations were made. I'm not talking about installations. I'm just talking about the speed limit. It's 25 mm -hmm. miles, and it goes to 30 miles, and you speed, then you get a school zone that goes down to 20 miles, and it goes back up to 30 miles. I that, mean, there's consistency with the speed limit. Would That's why one of the recommendations that's further in the presentation is related to the school zone study, is for specific questions like that. To get that done soon. Right. Okay. <clears throat> So our neighborhood traffic calming program, uh, we touched on this at the November study session a little bit. Uh, we formalized this program in September of last year. Uh, prior to that, we would just receive phone calls and emails, and now we have a web page on our Littleton website with a form that residents can submit any uh, requests through. Um, requests have to meet certain thresholds for us to do any type of infrastructure improvements. So this includes having a minimum average daily traffic of 500 vehicles or more. 
Um, for speeding issues, 15% of the vehicles have to be traveling 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. Uh, we also look at crash history. Um, if the infrastructure is not um, up to current standards. Um, site visibility, we look at all these things. Um, but just with our limited resources, we do have these thresholds that we can't do everything on every single street that we receive a complaint. Um, we do have some enhanced investment in data collection, so the speed feedback signs as we just discussed. Um, just to know, our current speed feedback signs in the city do not collect data. It's just the new signs that we would be purchasing would have the ability to collect data. Um, and then we're also in the process of procuring urban SDK software. And so this software collects data from GPS and connected vehicles and then shows speed and volumes across all roadways in the city of Littleton. So this is really going to help our data collection process. Currently we have radar counters that we have to manually hang up on a roadway, leave them up for up to seven days typically is our threshold of how long we want to collect data. Um, process that. So this will allow us to um, use the platform to look at all of the city. You can set in, uh, put in our thresholds as well for our neighborhood traffic calming program and it'll actually alert you. Um, and then we still have the on the ground methods to, you know, backfill this data, uh, make sure that we're seeing the same things that this software is showing us as well. Um, so we're actually going to be able to get onboarded with this uh, this month, which will be great. Um, we discuss all of the neighborhood traffic calming issues um, that are submitted to the form at our traffic safety committee that I discussed earlier. Um, and through this program, last year we installed 10 pilot projects, as Shane mentioned, um, some of the bike pilot projects of Bellevue and Irving last year. Um, and as Councilman Reichard mentioned, we done some evaluation of those projects um, on the effectiveness of slowing speeds. Um, and as Keith mentioned, um, with everything in this presentation and with staff capacity, um, we potentially would be putting this program on pause. Uh, we've received a lot of requests and we are just at capacity um, with how much we can go through. We have 153 open requests currently. I'm a little concerned to echo something the chief said earlier that we're not quite using our language well because Saying we're going to pause the traffic calming program is really just saying we're going to pause how we select which traffic calming projects we do. And what we're essentially doing is actually increasing the number of traffic calming projects we do uh, uh, considerably, but they're not based on uh, citizen input. They're based on staff projects that have been identified over the past couple of years, including some as, as, as um, Shane mentioned that had were evaluated by staff because of input from communities. So it's not like we're totally. I'm just worried we're totally shooting ourselves in the foot by our language here, and we're still making investments in this program because we're spending money on this software. Um, so I've just I, I'm worried we have a communication challenge here. I, I want to react to that. Um, it's not just the engineering staff; it's the intake of 150 projects at a time. It's them coming in and a citizen expecting some kind of response to say, hey, we got it, we're going to work on it, it's going to be a few months before we can touch on it. There's that component of it as well. It's the intake and getting, getting into the system, and that's a spot. And uh, I can, in Public Works, um, we're, we're pretty minimal when it comes to administrative support staff, and that's a strategy. So that's one of the things. So I agree with you wholeheartedly on the language. One of the things that, um, that I'm sensitive to is that I know that counselors get a lot of phone calls about this and emails about this in their neighborhoods, much like they do about snow plowing, as your public works director, shockingly. And so one of the things that we're sensitive to is the fact that those calls aren't going to stop. So we still have to have a pipeline for those to come into the system for people so we can respond to a citizen and say, look, we're cataloging this. We're gonna, we can't staff to get to it for another few months. That's the situation. So we still have to manage that part of the process because that, that part's not gonna stop no matter what we do. So, Jim, you look like you wanna add a comment? Well, just that we're gonna need all hands on deck is what we're saying to move these projects that we're I identifying tonight forward. And I think you're right, council member. We should be saying that these will be the priority traffic calming projects that we're establishing uh, and that we'll have to 
deprioritize our standard reaction. I know that Kenneth spends significant time, and the whole staff does, um, giving the ap appropriate level of uh, analysis and response for this this neighborhood traffic calming program that we have through the website where people can submit the requests and expect some kind of response from the city. So uh, it's just, this is one of the trade-offs if we go all in on these pilot projects and accelerating programs that we're talking about tonight. Right, but I think what uh, Councilman Breaker is saying is it's the the, the way you're communicating this. You're saying we're not stopping this. We're reimagining it because we are doing traffic calming in other ways. It's just, you know, I think if you say we're going to stop doing this, that's going to cause a bigger uproar than say we're reimagining it. Same uh, kind of um, result of what's going on, but it's just the, 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 the language you use is important. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for that. And yeah, the whole intent is that we would be using this time to get caught up on the 153 requests we currently have, which we would then evaluate for next year's pilot projects and all of the bike projects and pedestrian projects that Shane and I have mentioned before have come from some sort of public engagement, <coughs> whether it's through the trail study public engagement or requests through this neighborhood traffic calming program. One thing I'll add real quick that I think is an important note um, with this the speed feedback signs, uh, we have urban SDK is that that was mentioned. That's kind of a remote data collection. Um, one of the things they want us to do is still have on the ground counts because we give them the on the ground counts and then they plug those into their algorithm to make sure that they that their algorithm is actually producing things that are true. And that's one of the reasons that we went with urban SDK when we were evaluating different vendors is that their model is specifically tailored to the city of Littleton, uh, whereas other vendors we looked at had a national model and when we took our on the ground counts and compared it to the other vendors sometimes they were 40 percent off versus where urban SDK was oftentimes you know less than two mile miles an hour off in the data they gave us so those things kind of feed into each other just wanted to make that connection all right um, so in addition to all the pilot projects that we've just gone over, um, we also have a pretty large program of projects, um, bike and ped projects that have already been planned um, for the city of Littleton for 2024. And so here you can see a map, and as I alluded to earlier, uh, a lot of these are grant funded, and that's why you see a lot of these projects really on those uh, regionally significant roadways around Littleton, which are Broadway, Mineral, uh, Santa Fe, Be and Bellevue uh, are the main ones. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that with these projects, these 11 projects that are going to go to construction this year, is that these projects were really started years and years ago. Um, I think, Aaron, 2018, is that when the Platte Canyon Intersections Project was, when funding was secured? So just to give you guys an idea, um, you know, if we have an idea today and we want to get grant funding, it takes several years to go through the grant funding process, the design process, the environmental clearance process um, to get these things on the ground. So just to keep that in mind. Um, also just wanted to touch on development projects. You can see those kind of in the, the cyan color there on the map. Um, and those have been touched on a little bit, uh, but we do have requirements for developers if there's, if they're, the parcel they're developing, if there is a recommendation in the TMP to change that frontage to um, implement something in our TMP, then that is one of the requirements of the developers. So one of the things we're proposing to do on the immediate short term is to do initially two um, specific evaluations. The first one would be an evaluation of all the school zones in the city with an outside firm that would come in, look at all the flasher locations, flasher signage, timing, pavement markings near schools, all those kind of things. This one, if we could get this underway shortly, then we would potentially be able to install these improvements before school starts in the fall. Or actually, the, the, the school starts in the summer here in August. So part of the timeline on something like this is the ability to actually do the work, have information, and then act on it prior to the school year starting, if possible. And obviously, LPS would be um, shoulder to shoulder with us on this. The other question is, as you can see down um, in the bottom picture, that that's a traffic circle. One of the things that uh, we want to clarify is that we don't have any roundabouts in this town from a, an MUTCD or transportation engineering perspective. What we have here in town is just traffic circles uh, that were installed to slow traffic at intersections, and they're one tool of many in the toolbox. And so we don't, we don't have any roundabouts here in town from a, an actual engineering standpoint. Um, 
And so one of the things that we believe is important is a second study that will have someone look at every one of those traffic installations that are in there for traffic safety and traffic calming. That would include these traffic circles. It would look other locations where there's pedestrian refuges, for example, and medians where there are other locations where we've put divided, divided medians in or other things to look at all of the ones that have been done in the past that have been done and what, how would they look in a modern standard? And are there opportunities for us to change those? And these, are the, these would be the recommendations based on the modern standard and what we looked at in our own data in the field. So we would recommend that as a, as a, as a secondary evaluation as well. And then that would allow us to then attack the highest priorities out of that out of that to really take on how that fits into where we want to tackle first, what are the biggest dangers that we have, um, are there mod small and large modifications that we can make that may dramatically improve um, safety at a particular location. All right, um, and I alluded to this earlier, but uh, this is what we're proposing as, our, as part of the proposed action tonight as far as corridor studies um, and design studies moving forward, and you can kind of see the timeline there based on the different colors. Um, so, you know, we looked at that, that previous map that had the, the quick action bike pilot projects around the city, and these would be kind of the next step. And so we can go back to Windermere where we've got that section of Bellevue that we're pretty confident we can do some quick action on, but, uh, or sorry, not Bellevue, Windermere. Uh, but as we look south of Be Bellevue on Windermere, um, that's an area where we want to take a little bit of a deeper dive, understand how the community uses the street to make sure we're not, you know, precluding whatever uses for the street there are, making sure we're not creating any dangerous situations. Uh, we also want to take into account engineering considerations, right? Right away, drainage, things like that. And uh, these these studies uh, would allow us to do this. Would allow us to do this. So it wouldn't just be a study where you know at the end of the study we have a nice you know pretty picture of what it could be one day. But we'd also want to go to 30% design, which allows us to get a little bit more in the weeds, understand what we're dealing with in terms of cost or what challenges we might have to address when we actually construct the project. And this will also set us up for when funding becomes available, whether it's through you know CIP uh, funding or through uh, the rare grant opportunity where we can focus on these uh, streets that are not on the regionally significant roadway. Oh, that's me too. Um, and so uh, just a little bit of background on why these corridors are slotted the way they are. Um, so one of the things we did earlier in January, uh, the engineering department got together and looked at the, the five or the three year pavement management plan. Uh, and from there, uh, we backed out these studies uh, from that three year pavement management plan. Ideally, when we go in and we work on a street, we only want to do it once, right? We want to hit it once and not have to come back for a while. We don't want to come in and reconstruct the street and then later decide we want to move the curb and then later decide we want to do other things. So we're trying to be strategic in, in how we approach these. And so all these studies are backed out from that three year pavement management plan. Uh, a couple of things to note is, uh, again, just kind of harping on the regionally significant roadway and the, the eligibility of their, those roadways for federal funds. On this map, there's only one roadway that is eligible of the corridor studies, and that's Bowles there on the left side of the screen. Uh, that one is actually, we have uh, secured grant funding uh, that's available in 2026 to do a corridor study, but the rest of these will have to come from, likely from City of Littleton funding. One of the other things I want to highlight about this slide is that one of the challenges that we have as a city and as a department is because of the lack of spending that took place over the preceding years, we do not have basic engineering designs and topography and those types of things for most of our roadways. So we don't have on the shelf ready data that we can even spin off. And part of that is the last few years we've been just trying to catch up and we're still in that phase here. We don't have topography of all our streets in the city, and that's something that most of our peers have had for quite a while. So that's one of our challenges is, is, is it would be great to go out and do that, but we don't have shovel-ready data sitting on a shelf somewhere that we've collected previously. Because once you do the topography, the street doesn't change a lot over three or four years or five years. So getting that data in there, and that's a spice that the city of Littleton didn't invest in previously, and so we're still in the process of investing um, investing to get to that level of expectation so we have that ability to react more quickly with more information. It'll help us in terms of planning and all those types of things. And that's why you see this long list of corridor and design studies that are necessary to even move some of that stuff along. Sorry, um, on the last slide, is maybe you said this and I somehow missed it, but it seems like 
if we have three schools off and around Alati, that that should be a green line, not a blue line. Is there any debate in that? I, I mean, these are kind of certainly uh, up for, you know, mixing around. The, the thing we need to be cognizant of is if we, if we move that up, you know, we may not have the capacity to do one of these other ones, so it's just kind of part of the trade-offs. But, yeah, I mean, this isn't set in stone. This is kind of our, and, our first step. And part of that is, you know, Alati would be looked at with that traffic calming evaluation that we talked about as well. So we would be saying put a lottie off because we're going to look at these two studies on the previous slide to do a lottie better down the future. Mm -hmm. yep. I think I'd want to see it moved over to 2024 to this year. So you want to? You're, she said she'd rather see it moved to 2024. Yeah. So I mean, would that be then? What's the trade-off? Yeah. Taking Prince or Windermere or Powers? Power. Well. We're not making the decision right yeah. now. Part of that is just a list up there, and right. there's not information that shows you the complications of each of those. So we'd have to sort through that. From we'd like to take the feedback from yeah. 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 we'll That's get, my feedback, we'll get back and then to you. tell Thanks. us what that would entail, what that opportunity right. cost would be. But I think that's important. I agree with you, yeah. Council Member. Yeah, and, these were, and the timelines for these were determined off of the existing pavement management plan, but I think there's definitely... Brent can tell me otherwise to uh, move up different roadways depending on priority as well. So definitely we can, we'll take that into account. Um, you can kick to the next one. So obviously there's challenges and trade-offs. Um, just the, this is this, we've hit on this before. This is the plan spending already in 2024 that we've got built into the program. Um, one of the challenges that we do have is we have a lot of grant contracts in place that we're already committed to with the federal and the state government as well as Dr. Cog and others that um, preclude us from deferring projects that we're already contracted to deliver in this time window. So go ahead. Is that one of the photos that's not in the city of Littleton? Because <laughs> I don't correct. recognize that intersection. That's correct. We actually did that treatment right out in front of your house. Um, actually, that'd Great, that'd that, be great. Actually, that's one of those, see one of the things like, go back to that slide for a second. <laughs> Go back to that slide for a second. So one of, the, one of the things that we, you know, a lot of people think you can just go out there and slap delineators up. For example, we've seen examples just in pictures tonight that have C-curb, delineators, armadillos, which is what you see there, that are all those kind of things. And it's trying to find the right solution in the right location. And, and uh, it, just going out there and putting stuff down, there, yes, it'll have an impact initially, but we want to make sure that that's us not also complicating things for people that are out there, whether they, regardless of form of transportation, we don't want to make a situation worse. So that's part of the reason why, you know, some data-driven decisions are important. So go ahead. Um, so one of the things that we need to think about budgeting for is if we go out and do a whole bunch of these pilot projects, some of them will stay in that form in perpetuity. Some of them, because that's the, the solution that works. Some of them will need to a more permanent solution. For example, if you put a buffered bike lane in and you realize that you want to have C curb, a, a divided curb all along that, there's going to be an expense to that. And we, most of the numbers that you're going to see here, we would call soft numbers because, you know, we've been rolling this data up for 10 days to meet the deadline for tonight's council meeting. So you're going to see some soft numbers. This is based on our professional experience as well as what we know others have done. So this is a spot where taking some of those permanent, the temporary locations to permanent locations in the future, we have to plan for those kind of um, changes. We expect that, like what we have right now, would be at least $600,000 to make some of those from temporary to permanent, pilot to permanent. Um, potential project accelerations. Um, we have the ability to accelerate a number of, we've talked about it, different things, uh, corridor studies that are important um, that we could certainly move ahead. And part of those things is one, a ro some roadways are far more complicated than other roadways. We just talked about bowls is, is far more complicated than other roads. And so the, the time and the, the dollars that it takes to get through the, the corridor study process is going to be different depending on the structure and the type of the road and the ADT and all those kind of things. So these are things that could potentially be accelerated, all of these. Go ahead. Um, so... Um, council asked us to talk about the long term. And so one of the things is if you want to have a sustained effort going forward, these are some of the things that are going to have to be considered in the process. Um, in the short term, some of the challenges that we have are um, getting consultant and contractor availability. 
Most contractors, right? Most consultants are three to five months right now on backlog to get a project started. That's industry wide. That's not just us. That's industry wide. And I know we're really important, but we're just one customer. So that's that's something else. One of the other things is if all of a sudden we go out there and we start installing a whole bunch of supplemental um, traffic installations and those kind of things, we're going to need staff to take care of that because people will drive over the delineators. They will do those things, and so we're still going to have to have staff to maintain those things, which we don't have built into the current planning. Um, additionally, um, if we do bring new, new staff on board, you're looking in today's market three, three months to five months to get somebody on board and up and going. That's just the reality. One of the challenges that we also have in the fleet item is there is because um, during COVID, we didn't buy a lot of vehicles because we didn't have money to buy vehicles. We suspended that. So right now, we're in this year and next year, we're in a position where we're making a huge investment in public safety vehicles in replacement cycle. So as a result of that, we're also pushing off other ones. And right now, we've added staff and teams to work on engineering projects. And I have engineers that are driving out to job sites every single day in their personal car. We don't have enough vehicles to support our existing. And if we add additional staff, that's going to be something that we're going to have to consider as well. I can't have somebody bicycle out to every job site each day. That would be a challenge for us. Mm -hmm. um, so in the short term, some of the things that we would need would be the two positions at the top in bold would have the most impact the most quickly. All those things down below are things that will have to be considered over time if you want to sustain a large investment in this over the future years to, to keep this level of of support for the program going forward. So that we wanted to show you what that would look like. Go ahead. Um, so one of the things that we can do in, to, in order to do some of the things that we talked about earlier, these are some of the funding realignments that are going to have to take place. All the things that you see up there on that column are not currently budgeted for 2024. So the speed back, these are, like I said, soft numbers, best estimates based on our experience and knowledge. Quarter million dollars for feedback, feedback signs, uh, 145 for variable message boards and uh, via, uh, speed trailers. Variable message boards are the ones that are out there. It's important to make sure you have those kind of things when you do make a traffic change. Um, part of our regulatory infrastructure is to warn users that we're changing something. That's an important part of it. We also, we've been trying to add some of these already because um, we're pretty devoid of those and we get requests from folks like LPS and others to help out with them. Um, obviously, um, the pilot traffic calming projects that we've talked about, accelerating those, um, accelerating um, the purchase of uh, snow removal equipment that would allow us to um, additionally get into some of those bike lanes, some of the pedestrian facilities um, that we could do to, to deliver that out there. Um, school zone adjustments, we're assuming that after the evaluation, there's going to have to be adjustments in the school zones, whether it be moving flashers, whether it be changing signs around, changing striping, there's going to be a cost to that. Um, we talked about the 600000 earlier. And then one of the other things is that um, our sign shop as a whole producing signs is pretty dated. And, and actually, this is, there's a consequential thing when we look at funding in the long term is that I wouldn't want to go spend that money to replace the sign shop and upgrade it with that equipment and technology without fixing the roof above it first. Because I'd be worried about the building leaking and, and, and putting us in trouble with the equipment. So that's kind of a sequential thing for us. Non-capital um, is the school zone evaluations and the calming we I talked about, as well as sup the supplemental personnel that we potentially talked about. That number is basically just under two point three million dollars. So specific to the sign shop, you know, as someone that doesn't know where signs come from, is, mm -hmm. is there not an Amazon for signs? I mean, do you buy signs, or do every does every community make their own signs? The vast majority of communities, there's a certain series of signs that you you make locally. That's pretty common. Um, almost every agency has a sign shop of some sort. I mean, the, to me, to me, a stop sign is a stop sign. A twenty-five mile per hour sign the, is. A those 20. are the kind of things that you can get produced. Um, we, all those other things with street signs and all that kind of stuff. There's the cost difference between us doing it and sending it out is is substantial over time. So that's why you invest in a sign shop as well over time. Um, like one of the things that most people don't know is that over the last um, fifteen years. Uh, one of the federal regulations that has come down is a lot of the new signs all have block letters on them. And, and the reaction to that is, I'll just say it like it is, what drove that was baby boomers with bad eyesight. And that's why, that's why the science changes. 
I get it. I'm there too, man. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, Robert. So those are some of the things that we adapt to over time. And as we replace things or signs go down or you do a specialty sign like crab apple route, that's stuff that we, we need to do. So go ahead. Oh, Tiffany's going to come. She gets the next slide. I want to just go back to that one slide for a moment. Um, I just want to kind of pause right here um, for everyone. These for the are real costs. Excuse me for the public. Oh, uh, sorry. Could you introduce, your, introduce yourself, please? Sure. I'm Tiffany Hooten. I'm the finance director here at the city. Um, like I was saying, I just want to pause here for a moment and kind of just absorb these costs that we're talking about right now. These costs are not programmed into our budget. They're not in 2023. They're not in 2024 and going forward. And so with that, what I'm challenged with is trying to figure out how are we going to fund this significant need for this city. So we do have a 3A sales and use tax fund. This is the 0.75% sales tax that was approved by citizens a couple of years ago. Uh, we have a plan for this fund. We have a five and 10 year plan that we look at annually and we're still developing as we go. This is a new tax to the city. We're still trying to identify what projects we do wanna pay from this. And one of the things that I was tasked with is where did we end in 2023? Our fiscal year in is 1231, and so we are past that. However, we are still closing out our fiscal year. But when I look initially at the 2023 funding that we've received and funding that we've spent out of this uh, fund for 2023, I've identified two possible options here. And I know I have a big number of three million, but that's why I wanted to pause earlier on the 2.272 amount, because that's really what we're trying to solve, right? That's what we're trying to fund in this moment. Um, we do have additional revenues that came in in 2023 in the 3A sales tax. Not the same for our general fund. Estimates were a little different for both funds. Um, but we do have about $800,000 that we can go towards this program. We also have some unspent and unencumbered funds. Uh, so these are uh, categories that we uh, presented to council that for various reasons throughout the year, staffing, uh, shortages, uh, commodity issues, we just weren't able to get those projects started or even advanced in 2023. So when we look at that, between the two elements, the revenue and the expenditure side, we have about $3 million that typically would go to the fund balance and be carried into the next budget year. Sure. So of, of the 2.2 million unspent unencumbered, I. I, I totally understand that if the, we didn't, weren't able to spend it because we couldn't hire somebody, that's an opportunity that's gone and that right. money isn't. But if it was unspent because we couldn't purchase the equipment or couldn't, um, uh, you know, I don't know, find the consultant, those are still projects that we prior, that were prioritized a year ago. I mean, what are the projects that we're not going to be able to complete if we redirect this money away from? Um, the, un, the, the unspent, unencumbered. Right, great question. Um, so a couple of those items are related to uh, exactly what you mentioned, personnel. So a council approved an overhead allocation each year um, in the past uh, to help fund personnel to manage these projects. Well, we didn't get these projects started, things weren't purchased, and so we didn't hire those people. So there is up, upwards of $500,000 um, of that amount that is related to that one particular um, area in this in this fund. Some other areas are related to just some facility system backlogs. We've had some um, uh, projects that had planned that we we just either put on hold or we're not going to continue or the plans have changed and so we need to revalue that project or revalue or reevaluate that project and maybe look at it a little differently. And so uh, those are kind of the types of projects that uh, either weren't spent or weren't started or we are revamping them or looking at them differently. So what I, what I heard you say is we approved uh, projects a year ago or two years ago in the budget process, and then last year we weren't able to do it, and we decided maybe they weren't top priority projects. Is that what you're saying? No. I well, thank Keith, you for helping me Keith with that. Keith can speak to that more, more specifically. So one of the things that I'll, I'll speak to the spe specific examples. Um, two, I can just bring up right now. And the museum director is in the back, so I appreciate that. An example is that we had money programmed to address HVAC that's 20 plus years old at the museum that we know we need to, we knew, we know we need to address. But at the same time, the museum is undertaking a specific design study related to the future of their galleries. 
And it's important for us to make sure that we don't jump in front of it because we want to make sure that we have systems that support potential gallery changes as well as raised levels of protection for stuff. So we, we push that out. It's pushed out in future years. Another project is we've budgeted a half million dollars a year in 3A in the large spreadsheet, for example, um, for attacking, that's the word I want to use, attacking the median on mineral. Okay? And that's one that has you know, a whole bunch of issues with it. So what we did is in, we had hoped that we would get a half million dollars under our belt of that project this year. But instead, we got about $180,000 through design and, and feedback. And we also are waiting a little bit to hear back on the potential for grant money from the Colorado Water Conservation Board that would then stretch our funds even further. So those are questions that we'll have over the next year. So part of it is just moving, moving priorities around. They're not just a priority, but it's moving some of the work around in the buckets. Councilor. So then what I just heard you say is <laughs> there's $2, $2 million worth of projects. There's a big chunk of them that we still expect to do in the future. And so we're in some ways putting off future um, demands on our system. So we're, we're going to still have to deal with prioritizing money for this, either in the 2025 or 2026 budget? I think that's a, a fair statement, but I also would uh, mention that we also are going to receive additional revenues in future years because our estimates have increased, our base estimate has increased, so I am confident that there's going to be future revenues available to address these projects in the future as well. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, this is just a quick uh, highlight of some of the trade-offs. I just want to highlight everybody that Tiffany didn't have to adjust the microphone or the lectern when she got up here either, <laughs> Chief. So um, some of the things that are currently planned in the transportation program. So what we wanted to show you was what's currently planned and what's potentially movable. So right now we have about we we have the potential that we could push out one to two million dollars in um, pavement maintenance. There's obviously consequences for that. Um, you know we're we're still in the bottom quartile statewide on PCI condition. And so, you know, the longer you push stuff out, it, the more expensive it gets. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we talked just a few, few minutes about the other potential funding sources in Keith, 3A Keith, and some of the things that would potentially... Go ahead. What is PCI? Just for the audience. Pavement Condition Index. Thank you. So basically, what condition is your index, your, your roads on from a scale to 0 to 100? It's a standard measure we use in the industry. And then... Some of the other things that we would potentially move around in the future that could have an impact if, if funds were shifted to this, like the counselor just asked, are projects that might be pushed out a little further would be things like city facilities, city facility backlogs, um, cultural facilities investments, those kind of things that are out there in the other space of 3A investment. Um, we assume that you know costs, what we've seen is that we, if we defer a project, it's about 10% a year is what we're seeing now for the cost improvements. Um, and then one of the things that we've tried to build over the last few years is um, the reputation for the Public Works Department for a long time was you would complain about something and we would say it's on a list. And then things would just vanish from there. And one of the things that we've tried to do is get ahead of that so people can know that, hey, my street is on in 2027 or 2026. So we've tried to work on that. And so we'd be working around some of that information as well. Um, all the things you see on the right are currently contracted projects that we have underway that are partially grant funded on the right. All of those right now are, are current ones that could not really be deferred. So I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm not sure what to do with this slide because I think you've come to us with a $2.2 million uh, proposal and, you've, and the finance director has said, and we got $3 million, roughly, and I, I, I'm not trying to. And so we're not actually right now being asked to postpone anything unless we decide to maybe move a corridor study up, which I think we could, but is that right? And I'll answer this, Councilmember. Thanks for that, that question. We want to bring you, and you'll see in the next slide, what some of those projects that could be deferred are. We want to bring Council, we've heard some interest in, um, you know, potentially shifting some funding priorities um, from existing projects, which given our grant commitments means pavement management is probably the place to do that. But we want to bring council options. We don't want to assume that the cash that Tiffany outlined from 2023 
is the way you want to go. That's our recommendation that we not delay these these of the pavement management programs. But we know that there's some interest on council in in considering shifts from existing projects and priorities to the to the the bike and ped planning priorities that we have. So when we get to the end here, you'll see that we're trying to give you resources to move things forward um, and not assume that you want to go one certain way. Can I uh, well, throw something in there as well to that point? I mean, yeah, you know, we saw the numbers that they look like they're kind of matching up, but as we, I think, get into the implementation, you know, time is still marching on and that's our worst enemy in this case. And for every month of delay, we are seeing those percentages of increases. So in fact, we'll actually probably be having to outbid other municipalities and pay uh, points over premium of what you would normally pay in a normal year of infrastructure consulting, engineering, construction, in order to actually make these projects occur. Otherwise, we are getting moved further and further back on their, pri on their list if we are paying their going market rates too. So, I mean, just because we have the funding identified for the estimates that we currently have doesn't mean that that's going to be static over the next six months either. And so having options to be able to actually mm -hmm. increase that funding will help get those projects actually in the ground rather than putting us to the back of the line. So we'll go to the next slide. So an example, one of the things we wanted to do was give you options. Um, Tiffany outlined some options related to 3A. If you went the route and you wanted to fund this amount of money out of um, the pavement and the capital fund right now, these are the kind of things that would drop off the list. Um, those neighborhoods, for example, would be the ones that more than likely we would drop off the list based on quality, priorities, and those kind of things. Postpone. To, We're not, <laughs> they're, 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 these right, wouldn't sorry. fall off. Excuse move, me. Out and, move out to future years. Let's put it that way. Move out to future years. We're still going to get to them, but it, it'll be in the future. So these are some of the ones that we have planned for this year that are currently on the plan that would not occur if you stayed within the transportation fund. So we just wanted to share that with you. Go ahead. Um, this is a summary of the potential acceleration cost, the 2.2 that we talked about. If you would like to take a run at the vast majority of those corridor and design studies, you're looking at 2.8 million, which is not in that 2.2 up above. Um, we talked about the fact that we, we have some personnel and fleet realignment that we're going to need to take care of. Um, we would be building 83 field projects this year. Um, when you look across all of those, and, and build means things like striping and stuff like that in, in crosswalk sections. Um, these are the other things that we would take on, two evaluations, five corridor and design studies, the other construction projects. And then one of the things that we're, we're looking forward to is, and part of this discussion is, is we talked about back in November, you know, one of the things that we as staff has wanted to get to is a point where this is a priority discussion for the community. And that's something that we've been working on and working towards. And so in the, in the TMP update in 2025, which is planned for the community engagement and all those things, that would be an opportunity for us to reset the whole scope. For example, I don't, reset the whole scope is pretty far reaching, but you know, for us to say that when, and that helps us as a staff do things like, if, you, if, if we have a choice between pursuing two different grants, and one is related to multimodal, um, bike and pedestrian infrastructure, and one's related to uh, an intersection improvement, we're going to have to be able to make that choice about where we put our resources to pursue those things um, and to support those. So that would be something that would happen in the 2025 TMP update. Uh, the 83 thing, I just want to give you a comparable statistic that just came up as we were meeting earlier. So the city of Milwaukee, 715,000, um, had a big press conference today to announce they're going to do 50 traffic calming and traffic safety projects this year. And we are 7% of their size. So we're taking on a big, this is a big move forward, um, comparatively speaking, to even much larger communities. This, this is the kind of lift that we're potentially undertaking. Tiffany can speak to this one. So I'm, we've shared a lot of numbers. We've shared a lot of projects. Um, so there's probably a little bit of confusion on where we are right now, possibly. So we wanted to just have a summary slide. So what you're seeing before you right now is on the left side is what our needs are related to pedestrian and uh, uh, bike safety. 
We have the 5.5 million, which is already programmed to our budget, which Keith uh, just uh, previously stated. This, these are projects that could shift out if council wants to use that 5.5 million to further enhance the bike and ped uh, program. And then we have the 2.3 million, which we're considering the fast track needs, which is that long list of immediate projects that we could address uh, immediately. So we have a total of 8.8 .8 million. As far as funding, the 5.5 million is uh, programmed into our capital projects fund and our 3A fund already with these three projects listed here, Centennial, Arapahoe Hills, and Euclid. The 2.3 million we're recommending come from those excess funds that are currently in the 3A uh, fund. So again, a total of 8.8 .8 million. So hopefully that kind of gives a little clarity of the funding that we have and options that you might have as a council to provide direction. So if council wishes to accelerate, as we've talked about tonight, we would look for direction on the 2.3 million and the, your preferences for how to fund that tonight. You'll note, as I, I believe uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, already pointed out, um, the corridor studies are not in, in are not included in that that 2.3 million, nor are those those fleet needs. We would like to come back to you sometime in the, the next few months with further further refinement of our projects and budget, um, you know, on how we can, how we could ad, uh, advance those pieces. But really that 2.3 million would enable us to get started on that work we want to get done in the next couple months. Um, and we acknowledge that we don't have funding solutions yet for the rest of, of those near to midterm strategies. Is that fair, Tiffany? Yes. So I'll take this. So I just can I get one, one more thing sure. before I flip it over to Jim. So what we've talked about as a staff is that you've seen a lot of different things tonight and there's a lot of things across the spectrum of options that are out there. And so what we, we're doing as a staff is after we receive direction from you, we've already planned we're going to, just like we would, we're going to regroup and see how that shakes out and then be able to present you the higher level of detail, what it's going to look like for us to get consultants and those kind of things so that we can we can specifically go in the direction that you would like us to pursue. So that's, as a staff, that's what we're strategizing is how we're going to respond to the direction that we get tonight. Yep. So, Mayor and Council, we re really are really looking for your, your uh, direction night, tonight on these these questions, as I started with tonight, the main question is accelerate and get these pilot projects out in the next couple months um, or stick with probably the longer process that we could budget for over the next, uh, you know, eight to 12 months and into next year. Um, you know, and then some of the uh, questions here about uh, pausing with better communication, um, our responsiveness that um, we currently strive for in the in the neighborhood traffic calming program to focus our traffic calming on these priorities we've outlined tonight, um, and then uh, alternative delivery methods. I want to you know I'll tell you that we're wanting to. Um, optimize our options within the new purchasing ordinance. I'm having conversations with the city attorney about em terms for emergency procurement, especially things like for the um, evaluations that we want want to get done, as Keith said, very quickly. Um, and even some of the uh, corridor studies could be, uh, be, be subject to that. I think we have some limitations that we have to have to think about that. But want to just get you know your take on that um, we've outlined two positions we'd like to move forward with funding out of 3a looking for your uh, support or otherwise on those and um, you know are there are there priorities within what we've presented tonight that council is most supportive of um, that we can, you know, if, if we have to, to, to shift some things, we can we can do that. That's what we have tonight, Mayor. So let's just go one by one. Um, Council, you know, 
respond to it or ask questions with it, and I'll just we'll just keep going. I'll start with Robert over there. For number one, I mean, does council want to accelerate this implementation? Um, so I've been working on my priorities uh, as we talk, and 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 I think um, first of all, I, I believe it or not, I have things to say. So. Um, you know, I want to actually start with uh, appreciation for getting us here to this place. Um, I want to uh, say thank you to my colleagues on the council for uh, pushing the city manager to move things more quickly and um, raise the priority for this. I want to say thank you to the staff for, you know, putting this together and, and creating a set of options. Um, I want to say um, thank you to the police for helping uh, Chief Stevens and his, his, his police force for for helping us um, kind of think about how we can reorient things, so I want to appreciate that. And I want to say thank you to the to the community, um, you know, and in particular, I, I met with Mr. Stewart in the past couple of weeks. I met with representatives of, of Vibrant Littleton, and I think, you know, I appreciate the community's work on trying to raise these priorities. So I, I feel I'm grateful that I'm on the council at this spot and being able to engage in these conversations. Um, and so. Um, uh, I want to start with that. I guess so. So, um, so I got some kind of high-level priorities for, for this work. Um, um, first of all, so, um, Robert, real quick, are you going to go? I was just going to go one question at a time. I, I'll, I don't I'll actually think those questions are well formatted. To be okay. With you. Um, and so, um, I want to I want to talk about my uh, priorities. Um, so I want to um, you know the you know the TMB, we had a presentation from staff, and, and I, I want to emphasize the importance of data-driven decision-making and the importance of collecting information for the, the projects that we are doing. And that means making sure that we have baseline data before we put anything in new, and valid and reliable data. I'm really excited about this new contract you guys have talked about, but that new data source is not validated to where we, you know, we need to work on the ongoing validation for that, and I, I want to really appreciate it. So I want to make sure we're in the position to evaluate things. Um, I also want to um, think about projects that are that are uh, in some ways low risk, and I think the and risk is in a couple different ways. We have risk of creating problems versus solving problems, but we also have risk of just making poor public investments and having to go back and, and redo it. And I think. The list of projects that you guys have presented, I think most of them are pretty low risk because they've been, you know, fairly thought out. And so it's, so so I don't want to. I guess I'm saying, you know, the the slide on the improvements in front of Euclid felt high risk because it was a lot of money and it wasn't fully thought out. And so that struck me as a high risk project. Um, within the um, projects and the list of priorities within the 2.8 million uh, or 2.2 million, my top priority is around um, the school zone work. And, and, and that um, is really important to me. And so you know, getting that evaluation done and getting those projects implemented over the next couple of years, or next year, before the end of the year, is, is really important to me. A second priority is, is there was a newspaper article by one of our um, friends uh, at the Littleton Independent about how staff are leaving Littleton um, because of, of of changes in workload and feeling overworked. And, and ultimately, you know, the vision that was outlined in the public comment this, when this meeting started is really a, a vision for, for culture change, not just picking a few projects to implement. And that culture change has a, a couple different components. Um, that culture change absolutely requires education and engagement. That culture change absolutely requires um, enforcement as part of that. It absolutely requires new and different um, um, infrastructure and building new and different infrastructure. And it absolutely requires a top-notch staff that can kind of implement that culture change for us. And not just staff within public works, but staff in the, in the, in the um, communications department, staff in the police department. I mean, and so I don't want to sacrifice staff for, for this year of, year of investments. Um, so, you know, going through the big things, I'm perfectly okay with the accelerated plan that was the 2.2 million. I really want the projects to be connected and be thoughtful. I'm worried about that Bellevue project that's kind of off in the middle of nowhere and whether that's really worth our time. Um, and I support um, 
the switch in public engagement that where we get feedback when it's done, I think that's fine. Um, so I, report, I support the three, you know, 2.2 .2 to $3 million investment. Um, uh, the ca I, I support changing how we uh, select projects from staff selected project to the traffic calm from the traffic calming input. Um, um, so which I think is the same as number five. Um, app, if I, I think I've made it clear I support staff. And for the 2025 budget, my priority is corridor studies. It's that slide, I think slide 18, putting in those corridors are going to be what changed Littleton in the long run. And so being thoughtful and effective around our corridors is, is a top priority um, going forward. There. How was that? I did actually do what you asked me to do. You did get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Councilor Grove. Question for Keith. Um, we talked about a lot of information. What we doing is taking the TMP and just are we picking what we had in the TMP based on what we want to do now and narrowing it down? Are we doing something different? I think that's a really good question. So all of these long-term things like improving pedestrian, improving multimodal access, those are things that are all already in the TMP. So what we're talking about is um, within the TMP itself and how that, how that is executed. Because if you think about the transportation master plan, that's a 20 plus year document, which then gives us the framework that we, we make decisions on projects and capital projects. And so that in itself is moving things around. And if council wants us to um, change that direction based on the TMP, that, that's part of the discussion. And so the things that are, we're talking about are in there conceptually. The TMP is not a list of specific neighborhood projects. So this isn't how do you execute that, which is the strategic part of uh, the TMP. So we are still using the TMP at the highest level. Right. And sticking to our process where we did have community engagement, took all that time mm -hmm. way back when to do this. Now we're just getting more specific. Yeah, that, and that's part of every, you know, every planning project. For example, you know, in, um, in a few weeks, you're going to see the Kettering, Gallup, the Kettering Gallup master plan on the open space side. There's going to be options in there. You look at it, you narrow it down, and then you make a decision about what do you do first and where do you go from there. Same thing in these particular areas. If we decide as a community that we want to um, prioritize um, multimodal or other things versus how we weigh those out and we balance our project selection, yeah, we'll do that. That's part of the TMP execution. Okay, so I guess you're looking for like a one through seven thing. Um, okay, so uh, I wish we had more time to do public engagement on this and then would get input and have a better chance of doing it correctly than having to redo. Um, I think there's a, a lot of our community we haven't heard from but we probably will um, <laughs> as this goes forward. And when you come back in July, we'll see how that goes. So um, I'm probably one of the few on council that would probably rather take a little more time. But I feel like I'm going to find I'm in the minority. So go for it. Can I agree with it? Uh, yeah. OK. Mayor Fordham. Yep. All right. Uh, I'll do my opening remarks then, and we'll actually do that. So um, uh, to uh, Council Member Reichert's point um, about staff turnover and burnout, it is real. Um, we are redlining you all right now, and we, we have that full understanding of it, but that is not permanent, that is not forever, and that's not gonna be forgotten during this point in time because you are the ones responding to the immediacy of these concerns and needs. So again, not only thank you, but we will show that thanks I think further down the road here um, and once we're past these decision points. But um, so with that being said, um, you know, with regards to the questions, yes uh, to question number one, please do accelerate the implementation. Yes, please defer that public engagement. Yes, support the recommended changes to accelerate those, uh, the funding changes to accelerate those improvements for that two point, uh, 
uh, three million uh, currently outlined, and we can start talking about corridor studies. Um, I think more towards the council uh, strategic planning session. Yes, pausing the neighborhood traffic calming program. I just do want to shout out since we have our community, our communications director here. Um, you know, obviously, this is going to be. We are going to be having to put up a stop sign on the communications portion of this, saying we understand that you are concerned about X, Y, or Z neighborhood traffic and or uh, pedestrian concern. Um, we are working diligently to fix outstanding issues that we have already identified and will receive your comments but not be able to address them. So as long as that communication is clear from our department and across the board, I think, and as well as council, um, we can't be shoveling additional community uh, neighborhood traffic calming uh, requests to the staff that we have just said please defer that uh, later. So it will be on us to also say, uh, heard and received and filed away for when we can approach it next. Um, does council support alternative delivery methods? Yes, uh, you know, whether that be sole source contracting uh, above any sort of required amounts, whether that be uh, design build contracting, um, whether that be you know alternative procurement methods, uh, I would like to explore the idea if there's the possibility there, but uh, don't want to give our attorney a heart attack. Um, the support the addition of staff in 2024, yes, for those two top priority positions, but it, knowing acknowledging that I think we should actually probably plan for, and I, I dare say actually probably plan for at least two of those additional operational and technical support positions, the field staff positions. I would actually be happy and willing to make a deferment of one of the pavement management projects if it were to mean the addition of additional field support staff again. Um, but I do think we need that field staff there to support it, um, the implementation as well. So um, if that is where the trade-off is going to occur, um, I'd be happy to make that, tra make that trade. Um, in 2025, uh, conceptual support for, the, for that budget. Um, we'll have a lot of chance to work on this over the weekend. Um, but obviously, I think, as Council Member Reichardt said, you know, continuity um, it, through these corridor studies is going to be imperative. Um, um, quite frankly, uh, you know, we, hopefully at this strategic planning session, this is my final point, uh, that we are looking at alternative funding sources. And, and I, I know I've harped on this point. Um, but this is exactly why debt and bonds are, are utilized in cities to take care of infrastructure solutions that we know we need to do in the future. Um, and the cost and time is now. Um, I will say, you know, planting that tree, uh, it does, it, not only is it the right thing to do now, it's oftentimes in orders of magnitude cheaper to do that tree planting now. So, yeah. If I may, Mayor. Um, to that point about funding, I think I was a little, little cryptic a minute ago. The, the the bond financing, you know, and our plan for that, especially at, you know as we've contemplated it so far, it's mostly for facilities. That's what we need to put through that debt filter and think about how this would fit with that. That we'd like to get back to you. Excuse me, later. Uh, in a few months, once we've had time to kind of put all of that uh, together, but your your idea for um, advancing priorities, if in fact that's where where council is, um, could contemplate some bond financing for those those capital projects that you saw here that will take more funding. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'll jump in, but to expedite the process, uh, Council, we're getting close to 10 o'clock. Anyone want to make a motion to extend discussion past 10 o'clock? Mayor, I move to um, extend the meeting time to 10.30. There's a second. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion on that? I don't think we're going to finish this and the next uh, item uh, in the next six minutes. So uh, voting's open. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just going to jump in the line here. Um, so number one, uh, yes, I uh, support this accelerated uh, path here. Number two, yes, I think part of it is also I think 
at least it was my thought and I think council's thought and probably the community's thought that um, we would be doing these things kind of uh, at the same time as getting stuff out there and not waiting until after a community uh, uh, outreach in, in the spring. And so I think that's kind of where we got some pushback for. So I certainly uh, want to make sure that we're not just ignoring it and pushing it off, but work in tandem to go and do that. Um, Yes, I think I uh, support the recommended funding changes. It, there, there was uh, a lot of numbers thrown out there in different different ways, and I, if I understood what was up there properly, yes, that makes sense. Um, four, I'm gonna say yes and no, um, because I think this entire discussion that we're having is, rather than just neighborhood traffic calming, it's community-wide uh, traffic calming. It's, it's, this, it's, it's a broader discussion, it's a more strategic approach. So I don't want it to say we're, we're pausing it, we're ending it, we're doing this, we're reimagining, we're doing things, we're just doing things differently. Um, and so I know that'll be how we get that out to the community when people expect, you know, they want a speed bump put in front of their street and um, how that works, it's just gonna be a different uh, path forward with that communication. Uh, five, yeah, I, I think we need to be more uh, um, open-minded and innovative for how we go through and do these things. I know the, the whole, with our uh, procurement process. Um, hopefully that'll allow us to do that. Um, six, yes, with the caveat that I believe that we, that the finance director said that, you know, we could find the, fun the funding for the 3A, um, make sure it's coming out of that, make sure that we have those numbers identified that we can cover that. Um, and seven, I'm not, you know, I think that we can have that discussion um, at the retreat and further on for the next year. I think that's a, a bigger discussion because I think as, uh, Councilmember Reichert said that this is truly, you know, what what everyone in the community and I think everyone on council wants is for the best infrastructure that we have in the city. And we want it as fast as we can get it and immediately. However, we understand that that's it's a complex issue. We can't just, as I said before, snap our fingers and have things done. Uh, we want things done um, right, so we're not putting in. Um, devices or implementations that actually cause uh, bigger problems um, in the future. And so this is that, that culture shift. We want, if we, we want this, I want this ingrained in our culture where we have um, bike and pedestrian safety and crosswalks and everything at the same level as when we go through development processes with cars and things like that. So it may not meet that immediate gratification that we're all looking for, but I think in the long run is the um, prudent and, and best way to approve it. So. Peters. Um, yeah, thanks for putting this together. I realize it was probably a big push. Um, but I, I do think we've had a lot of public engagement and a lot of people speak up to say that we want a kind of a priority that doesn't put cars first. I feel definitely like we should punt some of those mill and overlay projects for um, these things to move forward. I think yes, on number one, I, I agree with pretty much everything Kyle said. Um, I would love to hear more, like I don't know exactly how this could be parsed out. I don't really understand why we would get a snow plow, for example, when like there's three quarters of the year we could use these protected lanes, even if we can't plow them first. It seems like we should build it before we can maintain it. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I also think that, um, yeah, we've just prioritized cars for a really long time and I think that it's, I think we're hearing from a lot of people that we should move forward with, like Reichardt said, some low risk things and get more engagement as things move forward. And definitely more staff. Enough. Councilmember Ryden. Yeah, I wanna piggyback on what council members Reichardt and Peters said, just thank you. Thank you for hearing what our community has been saying, what, what we asked for. I'm very grateful for that. And the fact that you dropped a lot of things to be able to do this, I am very aware of that, and I appreciate that. This was very thorough. There was a lot of numbers, uh, and I imagine it was not comfortable because you don't have 100% um, accuracy on some of the things that you presented to us, so I appreciate um, expediting that and just the work and the effort that it took and staying here at 10 o'clock and this is talking to the capacity issue I that council member Barr mentioned, and I truly do really appreciate um, your putting this all together. Um, I echo the needs of just good communication strategy on what we're gonna be doing. Um, one through six, 
for the most part, yes, I think I completely support what you've, what you've put together as a start. Um, with respect to number two, I don't think, I think, Mayor, you were kind of alluding to this, we're not deferring public engagement. We already heard from the public. So in my mind, we're following through on what we've already heard and then just matching that with the research that we already have and moving forward in good faith. Um, I'm really glad we're gonna be focusing on some of the traffic calming stuff, especially those roundabouts. Um, I think those are so confusing and um, I'm surprised there hasn't been more fatalities um, related to that and so I'm really glad we're gonna be taking a deeper look at that and I look forward to what comes out of that. One thing that I didn't see in what was proposed was, um, or in any of the pilot was adding stop signs or lowering the speed limit, which is something we've talked about. Now, I think what I heard was there needs to be more data collection. Councilmember Reichart, that was really important to you. My, what I, the only thing I'm concerned about at that is I feel like the best practices in the research is still in that car-centered model. And so I just ask that we be really deliberate when we're looking at that, that research around what goes into a speed limit. Um, and we're not completely focused on what's been, how we've been doing that for the last 50 years. Because um, I do think we can lower speed limits. Um, and then on number six, Mayor, I agree with you. Um, I, I do want to make sure that 3A can cover those and we can sustain those positions as requested. Um, that is a lot of FTEs, um, so I hope we can continue this conversation as we prepare for the budget in October. Um, so again, thank you everybody for preparing this and staying, talking to us individually and uh, helping us really be able to respond to these community needs. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, I uh, reiterate what everybody else has said. Thank you for all the efforts. Um, you know, this is a big topic. This is a huge topic, and, and as I said in our study session, um, you know, I, I do believe uh, enforcement, uh, speed limit enforcement, is that could happen tomorrow. I keep saying that. Um, I know we're, we're short on staff there. I would like to see more. Uh, I know we, we've given, uh, approved a budget for additional five or six officers this year, but I do believe uh, if we became a city of enforcing our speed limits, a lot of this could go away uh, quickly. Um, and, and, and back to what Councilman Reichert said, I'm 100% agreement. I'd like to really focus on the school zones. Uh, some of this other, these other things were, were citywide, I get that, but this conversation tonight, I really think is meant for the school zones, and I, I definitely want to uh, um, accelerate that program. Um, so that's number one. Uh, two, yes, uh, uh, as Gretchen just said, we've done a lot of this uh, public engagement already. Uh, we've been listening to you, and, and you know we're moving forward. Um, so yes, that's happening. Absolutely, we'll listen more. Um, same with three, uh, and, I, and again with. Um, that's a yes on three. Four, I'm, I'm with Kyle on that one also. That's a yes, no to me. Uh, the traffic calming, it seems hand in hand that, you know, in those uh, areas, those primarily the school districts, we got to slow the traffic down. But, you know, I'm looking at where I drive a lot, which is Bowles, and we got a lot of kids crossing over Bowles to get over to Goddard. Um, that is a big concern. So traffic calming uh, in, in where neighborhoods cross over major intersections, I think is a huge uh, issue. Um, number five and six are both yes, and then and then uh, certainly number seven. It just seems like it's more discussion. But um, to Pam's point, I, I agree with Pam to a certain point also that I, this is a huge topic, and and to take what we've already approved last year, and and, and basically say okay, let's put all that on the side and let's accelerate all this other stuff. I think we can cut this down and, and really uh, uh, cut that number down from 2.3, you know, down as, as uh, Adrian said, uh, uh, you know, snow plow of $242,000. I mean, I get it, you know, a new, a new sign making, I, we need all that, I get it, uh, but can we cut it down a little bit? So that's my opinion. So, city manager, did you gather all that? Uh, every word. Every word? Uh, it's, rec it's recorded. You can go back and listen to as it. As we will. <laughs> but I would like to try to reflect back themes that I heard with respect to all counts, to all the feedback that we just heard. I think I know there are some variations on what I'm about to 
reflect back, but I'm going to try. And if you, if there's, I'll look to you, Mayor, to kind of help if there's heartburn with any of these in terms of the majority view. I'm hearing council uh, would like to accelerate <coughs> the uh, capital pilot projects that were out outlined tonight um, in general. Um, you are comfortable with shifting our emphasis from public engagement up front to doing it differently and um, moving faster on the installations and coordinating public engagement along the way. Um, and that will be coordinated, I believe, also with our TMB, especially on an, on an ongoing basis as, as we get further into this. Um, I'm hearing for funding, this didn't come through real clearly in the comments, but while I heard some interest in shifting a pavement management neighborhood for this summer, it didn't come through real strongly. Is council comfortable with starting with the 3A funds that were I identified um, as available for this year? And that was in that table where they had the two different columns and right. one was the recommended so funding. I think, yeah, I think that was kind of- Starting with the 2.3 million, within the 3 million that we've identified preliminarily. So starting with cash that we have before considering the uh, postponement of planned pavement management programs this summer. I think generally, yes. Okay, yeah. generally. All I ask on that one is just that we have a really great communication strategy, Kelly, on how we tell that story that we're shifting so that yeah. I can at, communicate At this that. point, we're not shifting. We wouldn't be postponing pavement management. We would be using the $3 million identified as available in 3A there. Right. So, and uh, communication is gonna be important for all of this. Can we go back to the slide? Please, with the questions. Um, I'm hearing that. Jim, let me clarify that. So, with all the slides, and so we're going to use 3A funding, and the unspent and unencumbered is still from 3A. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Um, when it comes to traffic calming, I think it's really about communication, is the, the message that we've heard. This is all about traffic calming. And we do have a term of art, the, tra the Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program, that we're going to have to message about priorities. And, and really, I will say, this, this wasn't from your comments, I think a, a lot of that mayor is going to be emphasizing what we're talking about tonight. And it really ties in with the overall priority of bicycle and uh, pedestrian safety and less about you know, what we're pausing. But we want to be clear with council because we know, as Keith said, that you hear these these comments and requests for the reviews of the, you know, of the uh, intersections, the speeding on the streets, that is, I'll call it, outside of some of the things that we've, that we've uh, talked about tonight, won't have the same level of response at the household level that these priorities that we're, we're talking tonight will have. Um, it's all about traffic calming. It's all about pedestrian and bike safety. It's all about slowing down traffic in our, our neighborhoods. Um, but we just want to be clear that there will be a little bit of a trade-off in terms of our responsiveness to the in individual households that are calling for evaluation of their, their neighborhoods. Um, we're going to do whatever we can to move these uh, urgent contracts forward within our purchasing ordinance. And uh, I'm hearing support for the two positions, which I feel is responsible. It bumps our share of um, 3A funding used for 3A project management from about 15% to about 17% percent, which I feel is, is still reasonable for managing all of these up to $12 million of projects total, transportation and 3A uh, wide. But just so we all know, that's what that means. Uh, and then um, I think we'll continue this project pending uh, conversations about funding 
and potential bond fi financing and all of those things in the, the 2025 20, budget throughout the year. And I'll just say that, you know, this isn't, this isn't the, the, the last of these conversations. Uh, Keith and Kelly and uh, the police chief and I will be talking soon about when we can get back to you with the next update on this work that we're doing and what you, the, the direction that you've uh, given us tonight and we can kind of take those next iterative steps on future year planning and future priorities. But I want to offer my own thanks. Well, first, Mayor, I'll, I'll ask, do those sound like what you heard from council? And I'll look to council for the general yeah, answers. Head nods, so yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And I want to offer from- we have a, a, a focus on the school zones, which I think that was part of focus you know, on the main, school, school zones too. main part yeah. of the, the presentation there. So yeah, and I want to thank our staff too. This this, this has been a push, um, and uh, it will it will uh, not stop tonight. But I think um, we've all this has been a, a really good conversation for us and we for staff, and I hope that it has been uh, for you. And we're going to keep this communication going with, with you and the uh, community. So. Yeah, Councilmember. I want to apologize to staff. I, I became critical of the questions when I should have just admitted that I just had a lot to say. So I apologize for what I said. <laughs> and my I understood, Councilmember, thanks. I just wanted to go off script and, and I became critical of staff when I should have just said. You, you could have been critical of me and just said, I don't want to do what you want to do. I'm going to yeah, start talking. I apologize okay? for that. That was not <laughs> right. uh, helpful or appropriate. So. Thank you. All right. Well, we got 19 more minutes until the clock runs out again. Um, so we have we still have another agenda item here. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, um, item 10 on the agenda is ordinances on second reading and public hearings. We have one tonight. We have ordinance two of 2024, an ordinance on second reading amending title two, boards and commissions of the Littleton City Code, approving changes to the authorities, boards, commissions, and committees. And so while staff changes over and uh, the public goes home and goes to sleep, we will um, pause for a second and uh, I'll turn it over to the city manager to kind of give us the uh, I can tap dance pre presentation on. on uh, As is my want, I will talk for several minutes and cover most of the content in the presentation. <laughs> yeah. So this, this item is following up on the uh, council's uh, study, study session from December, um, which was the culmination of approximately uh, eight or nine months of research on the part of staff um, to evaluate the operations of our authorities, boards, and uh, commissions. Mostly we had noticed and council had noticed, had uh, asked for that study to evaluate consistency of how they're structured, how they operate, um, clarity of purpose, lots of those things. And so um, the study session in November, or sorry, December, asked a series of questions where you, gave, you were able to give us direction and we thought we had pretty clear direction from you. We think we do from that sec sec session on some of the um, administrative changes to naming of our boards and commissions, how they operate, finding some consistency among them were appropriate, but not for consistency's sake. We heard that come through. So tonight, some of those changes and some of that direction resulted in the need for modifying our code. And that's what we're doing tonight primarily. We've also recapped what we heard from you in the study session, wanting to just seek your confirmation or um, you know, modification of that direction if we didn't get it quite right of all of those administrative items in terms of how our boards and commissions um, operate and function. All of this, pending your direction tonight, the ordinances will be scheduled for second reading. This is second reading tonight, excuse me. That'll be finalized, but we'll be compiling all of the other material into that handbook that we talked about that we can have ready for the orientation for the boards and commissions as we get into that in March. So with that, I will ask our staff to just summarize, and uh, we don't have to walk even through all of the items, um, and uh, we'll, we will take uh, council comment from there and also your consideration of the ordinance. 
Uh, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. As I'm sure you are aware, we have 15 minutes left. And so I would like to, um, a lot of this is going to be Can you just identical. introduce yourself for the audience? Oh, I apologize. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Watts. I'm a management fellow with the city manager's office. Um, I've been working on the research for this um, since I started, almost one year ago uh, next week. So um, we... A lot of the content that is in this presentation, all of it is um, uh, identical to what is in the packet. So I would, I'm would, i happy to go through the presentation. I'm also happy to just jump into a discussion if you'd like, given the time. Um, Let's hit slowly some cycle points. through so people watching Absolutely. can see that, but we can, yeah. So we have two main groupings of changes. One is ordinance changes, and then the other are some more administrative changes. Um, I will note that all of the um, changes, they don't, Sorry, apologies. Um, there are three ABCs, uh, authorities, boards, and commissions that do not apply under all of these changes. Two of those are authorities, and so those are um, autonomous bodies that, based on uh, state statute, council has the ability to appoint members to, um, but that's sort of the main purview. Um, and so those would be South Metro Housing Options and the Littleton Development, Downtown Development Authority. And then the other is the Election Commission. Um, in order to make any changes to the Election Commission, because it is codified in our charter, we would need to have a vote of the, of the um, public. And so if that's a route that council would like to go, we can absolutely incorporate that. We might talk about our, that on Friday. Yep, so we will move on. Um, <laughs> next, um, so just as a quick background, um, we brought this, uh, this came out of the April retreat last year uh, to review these. We came from, uh, we brought to you all of our audit in a study session on December 5th, and then we had the first reading on January 16th. So the biggest, um, one of the biggest changes would be uh, merging two groupings. Um, one would be the Arts and Culture Commission and the Fine Arts Board, uh, and the other would be the Building Board of Appeals and the Board of Adjustment. The reason that we are making this, um, bringing this option to you is, is mostly because the duties of these bodies overlap. Um, when it comes to the Building Board of Appeals and the Board of Adjustment specifically, they meet so infrequently that this would actually um, potentially give them a, a more consistent workload and also like really value the, the work that those volunteers put in. Um, but by and large, these these boards uh, overlap in, in duties, and so we think that this is a, a good use of, of both of those bodies. Uh, next is naming conventions, and I will just note that based on council feedback, there is one um, alteration to this, um, and that would be for the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Committee. Um, originally, we uh, got feedback that that all advisory, ongoing advisory bodies should be boards, um, but really this, this uh, body falls more in line with our definition of a committee, uh, and so we are recommending that we, um, at, at council's discretion, that we leave the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Committee as a committee, and it would be our, our sole committee based on our definitions. Um, I just want, so I made that comment to staff to, today about that. Um, doesn't require any sort of amendment because the nope. ordinance tonight is specific and it's not even mentioned in code. And so that's just, I didn't know if we needed to have a, an amendment with that. So we can take care of that administratively after. Correct. So as long as you're all. Um, does, does everyone okay with keeping it as change. a committee because it has a defined you know, purpose and output? Great. Wonderful. Um, and then uh, aside from the committee, uh, the you know, authorities would remain quasi-judicial, or sorry, quasi-governmental, um, which those are the two that we, uh, you know, the LDDA and the SMHO. Uh, commissions would be quasi all quasi-judicial bodies, and then board would be ongoing advisory. Uh, committee would be more specific and have a specific deliverable with you to review once that deliverable is met. Uh, for members and alternates, um, the recommendation is, uh, by and large, that what we are feel like membership is is right, aside from um, the membership for Next Generation Advisory Committee, well, board, should you make that change. Um, and, apologies, I just like got lost in the slides. Um, th the recommendation would be to set that membership at seven. Um, that, by and large, falls with the rest of our um, ABC bodies. Um, for alternates, we're recommending, um, well, you would be considering uh, no longer having alternates. We've um, experienced some, um, that sometimes that can be uh, a barrier to some people wanting to stay on, on bodies. Um, it also, we have haven't had experiences in, where, in which not having an alternate would have impeded business. I like to uh, talk about alternates and make one last appeal to my fellow council members. Uh, I can see the rationale for people thinking maybe they're not a voting member and they're not um, official for a year or whatever. 
But I also think if they're not willing to sit and learn that um, there may not be a good board member anyhow. Um, I would advocate alternates for just two of the board's commissions, no? Planning and HPB. And the reason for that is it would be lovely, maybe or maybe not, if we had all architects on both those boards. You get a plan, you read them, it's easy. There's a lot of procedures, there's a lot of code, there's a lot of ability to learn how to read plans that just doesn't happen right away, especially if you don't have that as your professional background. So I would like to propose, and I don't know if it's an amendment, but if there's any agreement, to having alternates for just those two boards. Defer to the city attorney. Are alternates, mentioned, alternates in are mentioned code in the ordinance? Yes. Yeah, they're well, in for the they are codified under the composition of the board. So for those two boards right now, I would say the board is comprised of five members and two alternates or Okay. Well, I'll just defer to seven Council Member Grove to see if, one, if Council has an interest in entertaining a motion to do that, and then if you want to make a motion, if there's a second we could vote on change. I don't know how that would affect with what it goes, but does, I mean, does, just go, does Council Member Grove Wait, uh, wait a have? second. Before, if the code says two alternates for each board, is that what it says? I'm sorry, it, for, for planning commission, it's, it is one. I think we moved them both down to one and perhaps with HPB as well. But one, been, I think, is plenty. It had been, and had been. the changes it was would be two, to remove that one them. alternate is what we have before okay. us here. Okay, so, uh, and I, the point, I, it, it, I, would support, I would support Council Member Grove. Okay. Do you want to? So I, do I need to make an amendment? We don't have a main motion yet. So yeah. we, we don't have to, okay. Right, but when we get to there, you would have to make it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Mayor, if I could just add one comment. Uh, that, that really, we're trying to create a, a dynamic process where we can make changes to boards and commissions in a regular format going forward. So for example, the change to the Next Generation Advisory Board to set membership at seven, if for some reason we see a really outpouring of desire to serve in that board, and, and uh, you know, in the coming months or a year, the council says, boy, it sure would be nice to be able to grow that to 10 or 15. We, we don't want to wait for four years or five years to be able to make changes. We want council's will to be able to happen. So for example, if you decide to go without an alternate tonight, and you realize at some point that you really want to do that, we, we want to be nimble enough to come back quickly and respond to you, and, and vice versa. If you add the alternate, and you decide it's not working, we, we want to be able to make the changes at your discretion on a timely basis, as opposed to waiting a full cycle for things to happen. Right, I just think this is, you know, we have a proposal to remove alternates. I think Councilmember Grove would like to just mm -hmm. skip that step and just keep them in as of right now, so. Thank you. Continue. Um, right now, uh, the only two positions that are spoken of in the charter and the codes are chair and vice chair. Um, right now, some of the authorities, boards, and commissions have a secretary. That role for quasi-judicial is uh, fulfilled by the clerk's office. And then for um, advisory bodies, that role is some have, some have, and some don't, but largely that role is fulfilled by the staff liaison. Um, so the as part of this, uh, as part of what you're considering, it would be that that the role of secretary is filled by the staff liaison, and the only two roles um, that either chairs and well, just um, just members could have would be chair and vice chair. Um, the next change would be um, that this is a bigger one, uh, would be essentially that uh, meetings of advisory bodies only would not be required to have minutes um, because uh, by and large they are, um, they are making recommendations back to council. They're not taking formal action the way that a quasi-judicial body would. Um, and so based on that, um, where you could consider um, moving away from minutes. Uh, in lieu of minutes, um, we would be able to, um, all, all, all bodies would also, would always still have an agenda uh, with public comment as part of that agenda. Um, and we could move to recording all of those advisory body um, meetings and have them stored um, on the website in the same way that we do with quasi-judicial. Uh, all, in, in addition to the record as minutes, um, all bodies based on your prior uh, direction will be providing semi-annual reports. And so that will serve as a, a record and a catalog of what folks have, uh, what they've been doing, what progress they've been making, um, 
and really help provide that information to, um, to the community as well as council. Council member? This is the one place where I have, no, the prior one, is the one place where I have the most um, um, concerns. So in, in the big picture, um, um, I've heard from my committees really different interest in, in minutes. And I think, um, um, so I don't wanna, this is where I, I don't wanna make consistency the, um, the enemy of, of kind of peop, people feeling valued for their work. I'm very, and I also am a little bit worried I'm, I just want, and I, I'm a little bit worried about the uh, recording and stored. That's kind of a new t new task and a new technology for people, and so there's going to need to be some training and that implementation. And obviously, one of the ways that we can do the recording is on Zoom. Zoom offers a tool for recording. Zoom also offers a tool for transcribing. And while I would never argue for uh, official minutes from the transcription. It, is a, it can be a very useful tool for locating where in the recording different things are said. So I, I guess I'd really like to be a little bit flexible as we implement this one to make sure it meets the needs of, of people on the committees. I'm not clear what you're proposing. Do we change? I guess I'm just worried, I, I would like us to maybe consider having a report back in a year on how well this part of the thing is implemented. That works. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, while we're sitting here discussing, I'm going to move that we extend this meeting to 10.45 p.m. Denied. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second to extend the meeting past 10.30 to 10.45. Any discussion on that? It's open. Patrick, you get a vote, or I'm just gonna close it without you voting. <laughs> you didn't want the to vote that, is Brian? six in favor with council member Ryden voting no, the motion carries. All right, continue. So, all right, um, the, the next grouping of changes are, are administrative, and so there are not changes in the ordinance for, for this grouping. So um, what we heard is that we uh, would like to better use the ABC handbook as a tool as a tool, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we would better like to use the ABC handbook um, to, re to have all of the information for all of our authorities, boards, and commissions. And so right now, there's information stored in slightly different places. Um, some boards have charters and some have bylaws, and we just wanna make a one-stop shop, essentially, out of the handbook, and so that all members of the, the public can go to that and get all of the information that they might need on how a body is constructed and, and what its purpose is based on how council has set it up. Um, this the, last one, the... But before you get onto that one, with that, I believe the hand, handbook, whatever we're going to call it, um, one of the things I want to see if council would be okay with is having a policy for council to consider when we make these appointments, as we're going to do in the coming days here, um, to make sure that um, kind of um, diversity and inclusion, kind of different perspectives to have the board so it's not all the same um, demographic, it's not all the same perspective that we can you know, use that just have that somewhere in that handbook. That's what council will take in consideration um, to make sure that our, our yes. bodies look like our community. Is that, is that okay with? As a goal. As a goal, not That's to say it has to be, has but as a goal. Be, right. I'm not clear. You're advocating for diversity in selection of members? Yes. Yes. Well, it depends on who applies, right? Well, yes, I know, but that's a, yeah aspirational to say we would like, you know, if we have qualified members, we want them to make sure that we have a, a broad spectrum of people to serve on these boards. So are we doing quotas? No. no. I don't know that I agree. I think we want the best people regardless who they are. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that we just is, we want good people we want the best people on the boards and we want to make sure, you know, we often have more people than can fill the boards. Um, right, so you're saying we should, we don't have enough older people, so the older people, we should pick this person even though this younger person may be uh, better qualified, but we don't have enough older people, so we have I'm, to. I'm not saying mandated, I'm just saying that should be one of the uh, considerations. Okay. I. I just think we should get the best people possible. That's since, my opinion. 
Since that's an administrative change that the we can take that into consideration, it won't affect your motion or your ordinance for tonight. Okay. At, at the same time, since this conversation is happening, I would like to just see if there is council uh, consensus or majority direction to include that as a goal or an, an aspiration in the handbook. Thank you. Yes. Can I? I've always been of the same opinion, Pam. The best person should be selected. We, you know, apples to apples, then we make a decision. But you select the best person for the position. Yes, Peters. I want this in there. Yes. 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 There you, go. you got four with one. <laughs> Not a response. <laughs> with four, we'll move. Thank you. Ahead. All right, continue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so finally, uh, maybe not finally, um, but just uh, confirming <clears throat> where council liaisons will be. Um, right now, the way that it is set up um, is that only advisory bodies per your direction would have uh, a council liaison. So quasi-judicial bodies would not have, uh, would not have uh, liaisons. And in a similar way right now, uh, committees also, and the, the singular committee that will stay a committee, um, pending your direction would does not currently have a council liaison. So just confirming that that is either how you would like to move forward or if you'd like to have all advisory bodies have um, a liaison. But right now it would just be for ongoing advisory. Looks good to me. Yeah, I think we had that consensus before. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, Another um, administrative update is that um, we will work to be able to have uh, advisory, advisory only ABC members be able to attend uh, meetings virtually as, as those needs arise. Um, still with the bearing in mind that we, that the goal is that folks are in person as much as they can be, but understanding that circumstances do come up and we wanna be able to have an option for that. And so for advisory bodies only, uh, for, this would not apply to quasi-judicial bodies who are making um, judicial decisions. I'd like to borrow from uh, what was said earlier in terms of let's evaluate this and how it's working and Great. see how it goes. I think we can absolutely do that. Any questions? Council, any questions? <laughs> I think I got my two questions. Um, all right, well, city manager, were you gonna say something? No, I'm just trying to make sure. I, th I think we've got any of the consensus direct majority variations from the, the direction. So that was what okay. I was thinking about. Well, okay, as this is an ordinance on second uh, reading, we do need a, a public comment period. So I'm gonna open that at 10.32. Anybody in the public wish to come and speak? Uh, Pam, yeah, Pam, I, I just, come on down. I didn't know if you were leaving or if you were coming to the podium. Yeah. I don't want to approach anything unless it's authorized. So I'm pretty much against this, and it's not going to surprise anybody. I've said that the council is not um, a monarchy. It's not an oligarchy. Um, you serve us. You represent us, the people. And to make these boards be more responsive to you, I think, is wrong, just un-American and wrong. Um, our charter set up the boards and commissions originally as fairly independent bodies um, with people who are experts. And um, Councilmember Grubb is right, these are people with expertise. And our council five, six years ago was explicit about that. And I respected those bodies and they added a lot to the city, I thought. And maybe I should say, I've been to more board and commission meetings than anybody here, I think. So I know this better. And I also know the old code and charter and I know what the disaster is that was made of it. So I have strong opinions here, and I think this is really the wrong way. These people should not respond to you. There is no semi-annual report to council or meetings with council. These are independent people with their own expertise who should do their own work. And that work should be recorded in minutes every time that they meet to, rep to record what they did and the value of it and the value they add to the city. So let's see if I can um, kind of go through here. Fine Arts Board and Arts and Culture have different people with different expertises. 
I don't think they should be combined. Definitely the Board of Appeals and the Board of Adjustment should not be. They are also different expertises. The only reason this occurs is our ULUC is so deficient and so defective that it, allow, it took away all of the city-oriented criteria and only says developers go for it. Why do you think we have a workforce problem? Because the ULUC, I, you know, I costed proposals. I put staff in for projects. And if my project resulted in an impossible to implement workforce. Can you workforce, keep the focus on the ABCs it was, and not the ULUC? I am. I am. The staffing of workforce depends on the ULUC. And it is deficient and wrong. So we should keep those two zoning related boards. They have different expertise. And in our original charter, I could see the value that they added. And I know people who are on them. Um, those are very vital. We should change the ULUC, not these boards. Um, I don't want these to be recorded. Going through recordings is so tedious. We should have minutes that add value, again, to the discussion that these people are bringing to our city. We need alternates. That's how people learn, as Councilmember Grove said. Um, Again, I am against this. I think it goes completely in the wrong direction, in the anti-American direction. Thank you. Anybody else wish to come up and speak? Seeing no one else, I'm going to close the public comment at 1036. Uh, Council, any other uh, questions? Or uh, otherwise, I'll entertain a, main, a motion. I move to approve ordinance. 02-2024, an ordinance on second reading amending Title II boards and commissions of the Littleton City Code, approving changes to authorities, boards, commissions, and committees, ABCs. There's a motion and a second from Councilmember Ryden. Any discussion on that? Councilmember Grove, are you going to? Now, can I make my amendment or do you yes. want to wait? Okay. Help. Check your email. Did you my email? I'm happy, to, can, I'm okay. happy to read the proffered amendment okay. for you. Oh, that's fine. I, absolutely. Uh, I move to amend 2-9-2 of the City Code Planning Commission Composition of Commission and 2-11-2 Historical Preservation Commission Composition of Commission to allow for one alternate on each. You want to say on each... What each on, commit on each? It's it's identifying two different sections, so one on each covers that. Okay. It does. We don't have to label which commission. Okay. Got we it. already did. Those numbers label it. Ah. Okay. Two dash nine dash two is planning commission. Two dash eleven dash two is historical preservation. Okay. So then I propose the amendment, and can, just, I need a second. I just say so moved. Yeah. We got a second by Councilmember Ryden. For the amendment. So we have before us an amendment to basically add back in um, alternates uh, to those two bodies. Anyone else have a uh, mayor pro tem? Yeah, uh, we're adding administrative complexity and it's not increasing functionality. The, the, the alternates serve no other purpose than to essentially be another member of the public in, in this discussion. Um, if you are interested and want to learn more about this, you are welcome to come, as the public noted, to any of these meetings at any time to learn about any of the subject matter. So I don't feel that the alternates are necessary. I disagree for the reasons I said before and because the alternates do step in and have to be prepared to vote if um, the whole board isn't there. So they supplement it and at the same time it's, they learn. Anyone else? I mean. Is that not a reason should we have a council member run as the alternate council member run for election to serve as the alternate to serve when someone I don't is think not you there? want to do a year of campaigning to be I, an alternate. I, I, I totally understand <laughs> that. I, so I'll uh, just, but there's no more administrative work. They just come along and they sit in the uh, on the dais where they sit out there unless um, just like anybody else. Well, I'll just echo uh, Mayor Pro Tembar's sentiments, and I will not be supporting this amendment to add uh, alternates back in. So. Any other comments? I would say I feel like the last couple of planning commission meetings I've watched, the alternate has been very vocal and really helpful in making decisions, so I support it. Uh, there, have, there are no alternates currently on planning commission. 
Our alternate is vacant. I we have seven the, full members. Okay. Maybe and I alternates can talk. They just can't vote. Uh, if everybody's there, okay. if everybody's not there, then they move up and vote. All right. We're ready to vote if there are no more comments. Uh, so a vote yes would be to add alternates back in. A vote no would to keep the ordinance as is with no alternates. Patrick. <laughs> the vote is five in favor uh, with Mayor Pro Tem Barr and Mayor Schlachter voting no. The motion carries. Thank you, Council. <laughs> All right, so we now have a, uh, an amended ordinance uh, that adds the alternates back in, and then uh, we do have the administrative uh, updates later that are not part of the uh, ordinance that was just part of the presentation of kind of this big old topic. So um, anyone feel the urge to speak on this ordinance? You got five minutes to speak if you want to. <laughs> or, or Council Member Ryan may run over and hit you. All right. I, I will oh, say one thing. Yes. What I think we requested, if Council agrees, a, kind of an evaluation on the minutes and the Zoom meetings at this time next year. Yeah, and that's not that's not In pertinent fact. to this ordinance. Right, but it's just part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, All right. All right. The voting is open. The vote on the main motion as amended is seven in favor. The motion carries. All right, and with that, uh, we're on to the next item on the agenda, which is adjournment. So it's 1041, we're adjourned.